Check Chuffy 1, 2, check, check. Hopefully this will all work. Hi, you're with Scott. I'm Ganji Kid. It's midnight. It's always midnight. This is right here. And you left here. Sometimes I call myself Grave Kipper. I don't know how appropriate it is when we're considering Madly I'm a can. So this is working. I've done the sound check. Look, hi, you're with Scott. I'm Ganji Kid. It's midnight. It's always midnight. This is right here. And you left here. Sometimes I call myself Grave Kipper. I don't know how appropriate it is. When... So yeah, I've done that. And we're doing Madly I'm a can. And we're doing Embedded Confessions. I'll quickly show you, this fella is the Embedded Confessions fella. I'll show you how we find it, look, YouTube, and you go Richard D. Hall. Now, I don't know if I should advise you go to Richard Hall's channel, because there's a load of shit on it. I mean it, like, we're talking about, I don't know about these, I mean, that looks awful, like doing a thumbnail with a, Star of David, Israel, and an American flag put together like that. The host and parasite. Pff, dodgy. I mean, I don't know what it is. I've watched them, but it just looks fucking not right to me. It doesn't look the sort of thing I'm into. <sighs> UFOs. There's all sorts of stuff. The politics. The Giordano affair. There's all sorts of stuff. But he did do a very good investigation into Madly I McCann, including Robert Murat. There were several videos about Robert Murat, and here are three videos called Madly I McCann's Embedded McCann's Embedded Confessions Part 1, 2 and 3 of 3. Uploaded in order 1, 3, 2. <laughs> okay, so that's what we're watching. They are very good, I will say that. As much as I think some of the other stuff he's put on the channel is rubbish, I think these are very good. I'm not going to watch the whole, like, as you can see, three videos, 45 minutes each. So there's a lot of content there to get through. And a lot of it is just this fella talking quietly. So we're going to watch a bit of it. Going to see what the ideas are, how it gets. I mean, I've watched this three hour, what is it? 45 minutes times three. So that's like two, two hours. <laughs> Wait, 45 minutes would be like half an hour plus 15 minutes. So two of them would be an hour plus 30 and three of them would be an hour plus 45 plus another I don't know it's like over two hours long so we're not going to watch two hours of this fella talking we're going to watch this talking for a little bit he's going to explain how he goes about it a little bit and then we're going to watch the actual interview that they were they were watching and I'm going to do my own analysis a bit and then we're going to go into some of the other videos they've done we're going to watch as many interviews as we can so let's start with this parents of missing children who show guilty knowledge of what happened to the child will often find a subtle way of insulting the child, insulting the victim. Of course, before we get started any further, I should also say it's very sad what happened to Madly I McCann. You know, it's sad that a child died. We find it sad. I make flippant jokes sometimes. I can be a bit of a uh, entertainer, I suppose is the right word, you know, trying to carry things along and, and boy things along, but uh, I will try and be respectful as well, because it is sad that they murdered their daughter. Blaming the victim, disparaging the victim. If you want to know more about that, check our YouTube channel out. This is my YouTube channel, your channel, everyone's channel. And if you go down and you go to videos and you look at the other Madly Armour Cam videos, which I will put in a playlist for you here, the book they tried to ban, episode four is probably the biggest, episode three and four, where I explain right at the end exactly what fully happened. We read the book of the police detective who was running the investigation. So that was a good thing for us to have a look at and read. And uh, he came to some pretty conclusive con conclusive conclusions. He, came to, he had some ideas about it. So we heard his ideas and then looked at the evidence that supported it. When someone is missing, like or when a child is deceased, we call it the angelic view. The child is elevated beyond any normal child. It just, everything is wonderful. And we hear the subtle disparagement in guilty parents. Uh, Casey Anthony actually called her little daughter a name, a derogatory name. I don't know about who that is, but he's giving us examples from real life about things that have happened. And he's explaining his thinking and a lot of this analysis, these embedded confessions, comes from a textual analysis. Of course, there's half an hour of this video that I've skipped over already, where he explains 
this is Peter Hyatt, statement analyst, explains that someone sent him a transcription for this interview. He doesn't usually take the time to transcribe things himself. So he was able to go over the transcription of this interview. So we're going to watch the actual interview and read body language and all sorts. He's been going off a written form of the interview and he literally goes through the language to try and ascertain statements that would be embedded confessions, they call it, where you accidentally reveal the truth even though you're trying to hide it. So that's where he's got his ideas from. Um, in shaken baby ca syndrome cases, the baby wouldn't stop crying as if it was the baby's fault. The baby wouldn't take her formula as if the baby was at fault. And what that is, in guilty statements, within human nature, there is some drive to justify what happened, to clear oneself. So, Makes sense, doesn't it? That makes sense. If you were a human being, as you are, and uh, unless you're Lex Friedman's artificial intelligence watching this at a later date, hello, artificial intelligent overlords. Please be kind to me. I'm good to you. I'm good to you. I, t I keep Alexa nice and tidy. Talk to Alexa all the time. Keep her happy. I'm good to you. Hello, uncontrolled historian. I did see your comment. Uh, today we've had a comment. Get on with the... Uh, where, when are you doing the next Madly I'm a Cam video? I'm doing it now. Sorry, yeah, I better get on with it, Danny. Sorry, you're right. Um, and I saw your comment <laughs> about the words in... in we, at least we gave some money to charity yesterday, even if we didn't understand what all the words meant. <laughs> Sometimes we need an uncontrolled historian flying around the place. It's my fault for not being so consistent. And Danny, I also apologise. Uh, this Literally today, I've had people in the house take the front door off the house and rehang it, if you can believe that, because we had it fixed like a couple of months ago and now it's starting to catch. So... Now, there's always something going on that seems to get in my way. But as time goes on, and I mean longer term time, longer term time, I mean, if you check out our YouTube channel, I've told you how to do this before, your channel, the Ganji Kid channel, videos. We've been streaming for over a year, maybe two years. That five-year-old video is five-year-old. That's why, you know, that's not the, the stream. Started the stream. This is the first stream video, and it took place uh, January 21. So... We've done January 22, that's a full year. We're coming up to January 23, that'll be two full years. And in that time, I've progressed from being inconsistent, uh, not knowing really exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> I've got a decent setup, but I was using an old Mac computer and there were some issues with the sound sync. I had issues trying to get computer games on the stream. We've, we've come a long way. We've come a fucking long way and there's loads of interesting streams to watch back if you ever were interested we do variety so it could be anything from marching band sunday to a full vr puzzle game where you're inside a tiny tiny model but you're also outside the tiny model controlling it which is really interesting we played five dates um mental health support all sorts you know a revolving door of content all sorts of different content up till present day which you kind of recognize now i guess so we're getting there, and whilst I'm getting there with my uh, content creation, you know, skills, tech, all that, I'm also getting there with my schedule. I'm also sort of settling, like a, I, I wouldn't use alcohol as an example because I don't drink, but like a Guinness, you know, we're settling nicely. And it will take a little bit more time, but when we do finally settle nicely, you'll find a bit more regularity sort by newest, sorry. You'll find a bit more regularity and consistency. With, it's going to be inconsistently consistent because there'll be a Genshin Impact stream followed by a Madeleine McCann thing, a Words on stream, followed by a, a podcast, followed by an a indie game, you know, a, a variety of different content, but I'm the one that pins it all together. So it's my stream. This is what it is. And uh, yeah, I took on board what you said and I'm getting on with it now doing the... So I better get on with it and stop talking about your chuffing comment, I don't know. <laughs> But thanks, thanks for poking me to get me um, going on. He did a great analysis of Neil Armstrong. I wonder if he is saying that they didn't land on the moon then. Is that what you... Am I, am I, am I to read into the subtext of that? I don't know. We'll, we can look at that another day if you want. Um, me personally, I kind of think they did. I kind of think they did. But we can look into it again another day if you want. I don't like the... Um Several things about this. I don't like it's a, bit loud, isn't it? a past tense reference without following up present tense. There we go. It continued there. Oh, it's because it's he's and, speaking down into his microphone. It's a bit loud. Um, when you put these Lavalier microphones on, everyone thinks that you want to point it up towards the person who's speaking. But actually, it's quite sensible to point it sideways or down so that this doesn't happen. 
so you get a more ambient area of effect around here and it picks up the voice but if, if you point it up at them then that can happen can't it so it's just that on the microphone that's popping we have a praising of the baby that i do like and then when she opened her mouth the whole world knew she was with us as a subtle way of saying that she was really loud i'm not sure that sounds like praise i have six children um, i have two grandchildren and i listen to the words of parents regularly he will put the bit of video in here they will put the bit of video in look so we'll, we'll watch this but we will adjourn from this in a minute and just go straight to the full interview and use these techniques ourselves because uh, there's a lot of talking in this two hours uh, and it's good talking but it can, you know I, I'm not I can't just present Rich's whole video Richard D Hall's whole video just entire can I so um, we're reacting and to it and then we're jumping off from it given the setting of an interview where her, the child is missing, it's not something I expected to hear. Now, it's not a point I'm gonna hang my hat on, but I've been called to the attention now that maybe Madeline was a little bit loud for them. So the point he's making, and I'll clarify, is that when you're giving a confession, sorry, when you're being interviewed about a crime that you committed that you're trying to hide and not confessing, the victim can sometimes subconsciously be given negative traits by you. And that would be, not you, not you, you're not a murderer. The murderer might give subconsciously negative traits to the victim, even if it's their own child, it seems. And that is some kind of human way of trying to balance in the mind. Like we think of people, this is, I need to talk around this a little bit. We think of people as being, in this case, good or bad, don't we? Evil, in cases. We think of evil. But I would argue that people aren't necessarily inherently evil or good, that they're just people and they make choices, sometimes good or bad. Sometimes those choices are criminal. Sometimes they do things that are heinous. And then sometimes they might regret that even and have the guilt and the turmoil of it going through them. If it was your own child, certainly you would have all sorts of different feelings coming up, even if you were a bad chuff. And we've seen recently in the news, you know, people who have abused children who have gone to prison for it, thank God, like that poor Arthur um, and, and others. So we know that people do some pretty fucking awful things, evil things. And it might just be me, but I'd like to open the window and throw them out. I mean, no, I'd like to open the window for some, some love in the situation and to... to give people the um, the good grace of thinking that they might have been decent enough people in very trying situations or situations they were failing to, you know, when people fall apart, they do some strange things, don't they? When people get really stressed, they do some strange things. When people get really angry, they do some strange things. And if you take them out of those situations, they might be quite nice people, but you know, life is a series of these situations and they might not be nice people. Uh, what I'm saying is, I don't necessarily think that Madeleine McCann's parents or anybody like goes through their whole life being an evil chuffer uh, 100% of the time. So I think that when these bad things happen and they get involved in them, they might have to find some way of dealing with it in their own mind. I'm not a bad chuffer. I mean, I did this bad thing, but I'm not a bad chuffer. So how do I reconcile in my mind that this bad thing has happened? I know it's happened. No one else knows it's happened, but I'm not a bad chuffer. Like, How do they... How do they, like, having that going on in your mind is different from just, I'm not a bad chuffer, I've done nothing. So what we see in these interviews and what, uh, get his name right for uh, respect, Peter Hyatt, what Peter Hyatt reflects on is the way that your brain works to deliver words, to deliver language, to think through concepts and then deliver the words and language. The way that works is different for somebody who has committed a crime and is guilty, feeling guilty, churning it over in their mind. That's different for someone who hasn't committed a crime at all. And so we see some quite marked differences in the written words of the statements, not the way they said them or what I think about you for being a chuffer, just literally the language, what you said. And what statement analysis and embedded confessions is all about is it's not an interview process with two people. Like this was taken from an interview, of course, so we have to bear that in mind but it's not an interview process. What would normally happen for a policeman or sorry, police person or a 
forensic psychologist maybe, maybe, I don't know, I'd have to ask Steve if that's the right term for what we're doing here. Um, but what would normally happen is you would get the, the suspect to write their, their piece or you would conduct, I suppose you wouldn't conduct the interview, would you get the suspect to write their piece? Because you don't want them to be putting any of you, any of the interviewer into this. You want this to be their words. And it's a bit like um, hoisting yourself by your own petard. You say all your words and then we look over them and we say, well, you said this. This is what you said. I didn't make you say, I didn't ask you to say this. I didn't say, what do you think about this? You said this. Now let's take a bit of a look at that because it looks a bit fishy because people who are innocent don't usually say this. People who are guilty usually say this. This is why they say this. This is a really good example straight away. People who are doing this bargaining, the bargaining being I've done something terrible, bad chuff, not me, not me. Um, the, the McCanns, you know, they, they feel, she, she might feel that she's done something terrible and guilty and, you know, is that the face? Yeah, it looks like the face. Yeah, but anyway, they might feel that but not be able to say it and it might come through, you know, this, this turmoil. So what he's saying is if that's going on with your child, it's hard to, isn't it hard to think that you might be able to ascribe some negative uh, characteristics to your own child? Like to say there's a reason they had it coming. I'm not a bad chuffer. They wound me up. Like, you know, that's the sort of concept that's being raised here. Jerry McCann says she was incredibly beautiful baby, actually. Uh, we're talking about past tense, was. That can be picked up. It might not be that important because we're talking about her state as a baby and she's supposed to have grown up a bit since then. You know, I could say, oh, I was a really nice baby. It doesn't mean I'm dead and I killed myself, does it? I was a really good baby. I was, because I was a baby. She was a baby. But we do worry about people talking in the past tense about people who they hope to be alive but know to be dead. Then they're more likely to speak in the past tense because they know them to be dead. It's a subconscious thing again. Kate McCann, we sound like the most biased parents on the planet but now, but she was just really compact and just really nice, round, perfect head. And, you know, and then she, she opened her mouth. The whole world knew she was with us. So the implication here is that Madeline was a bit of a loud screaming chuffer and uh, that can be like, they're not saying that's negative. They say it in a positive-ish way, the whole world. Like they're not saying she's a fucking loud chuffer. That's for you to infer and, and understand in your own mind. But they are saying that, aren't they? So I understand where he's coming from here. This is ascribing a negative character trait to your daughter using her name in the past tense. These are flags. He said he wasn't going to hang his coat on it or whatever. He said he wasn't going to hang his hat on it. In psychological breakdowns, in... Uh, body language analysis modern th thinking is that we're looking for clusters we, we don't look for uh, any what we don't do anymore is you touch your nose equals a lie or you're looking up over there while you're talking equals you're thinking about things that you saw it's not as straightforward as one to one what we look for is a combination of things so you might be touching your mouth and things while you're looking up there and you might say these funny words at the same time there's a cluster of things and if that's different to your baseline, then we sort of see it as a standout moment. We put together a group of clusters and we're really getting somewhere. So uh, I'd be wary of just saying, they said this, they're guilty. But of course, we've already gone through a series of videos looking at the uh, testimony of the lead detective from Portugal. And we've got a lot of actual evidence. Some circumstantial and some just evidence to point in that direction as well. So we're already coming from a position of uh, a certain perception and this is going to help to, um, it's going to help to, what would work the right word be? Uh, support, that's the word, isn't it? Support our, our conjecture or perceptions that we've already built up. Uh, if it didn't, if it went against that, I think we'd already also see that come out as well. We'd have to go, oh, well, I, didn't expect this you know I thought it would be a bit more like that but at the moment it's supportive of that so we're not hanging our hat on it but if we can build up a few of these then we're really getting somewhere aren't we it's a really strange place to be giving even a small complaint it should McCann level volume there's no <laughs> doubt about that yay well done okay let's sing another one I always wanted to be a mother um so we see that this is heavily edited as well, which is difficult. 
I don't know, maybe that stemmed from being an only child and sort of, you know, wanting that feeling of family. It's sad, isn't it? I do apologise as well for the quality of the video. There's not a lot of good quality video of the McCann's interviews available these days. After we've looked at this bit, we're going to look at some more of their interviews and find that it's hard to find them, which is a surprise if you're looking for your daughter, isn't it? Because you would think every interview you've ever done should be out there, catalogued, one after the other, help find my daughter. You know, I wouldn't get my media team to be taking things down off the internet and hiding them. That would look suspect, but obviously it's happened. Madeline was the daughter Kate and Jerry McCann always wanted. For years, Kate struggled to fall pregnant, so when Madeline came along, they felt blessed. They loved to photograph her, and she loved being photographed. This is the last picture of Madeline, taken seven... There is actually some conjecture about this photograph. The idea is that the shadows are wrong, and that um, some people think she was superimposed on afterward. But uh, I think that level of conspiracy might be taking things a little bit far. And I don't go that deep on it. You know, I, I base my ideas on their behaviour and the things they've said and done, the parents. Hours before she disappeared. There's a photo of her that afternoon that was taken at 2.29, uh, two I think, because we've got it on a digital camera. And she was just sitting by the pool, uh, with myself. And it is weird that he states on an interview that we've got this photograph of her uh, taken on a specific date and time because it says it on the camera. Uh, like, you know, it seems a bit weird, doesn't it? But without the access to the actual metadata, you know, what can we say? And we've both got our feet just paddling and she's so happy. I am concerned, again lightly, but it is increasing and here's why. They're speaking in terms of nostalgia. This is what we do when a child is not coming back. Don't worry, historian. I, you know, you have your two, people put these podcasts on these episodes and just leave them in the background and you know do other things. I'm happy with that as a concept. You know, if you want to chat, you can chat. If you want to rap, you can rap. Brr a tat. I'll let it roll. And yeah, you don't have to. Don't worry about. Just because I'm vegan doesn't mean I'm going to badger everyone about being vegan. But every now and then I'll bring it up, and you just have to accept it. <laughs> they are waxing nostalgic about a child that's missing and this is going to become right now a very minor point is going to become a major red flag for deception if you were able to put yourself into their shoes which is what we always do put yourself in the shoes what would you be like what would you be like if your child was missing and this is what um, is terribly missing from the interview it's difficult as well because this interview is 2011. Uh, let me just get the timeline up just to be sure. Madeline McCann timeline. So she went she went missing in 2007, and this interview is from 2011. So it's difficult. You know what would you be like? He said, but what would you be like? Sort of 2007, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So it's four years later. You've become millionaires. You've at this point decided, I don't know if you've already put yourself on the board, I don't know if that's on the, the timeline of events, but they had this fighting fund that was launched by the News of the World. News of the World, Madeleine McCann fighting fund. Like initially, after the first two weeks of her being missing, or the first week of her being missing, uh, you would... I'm looking for the fighting fund, just just the fighting fund. I mean, 2007 news headline there saying it's topped more than a million pounds. Um, independent news, 2021. So we know the fighting fund had more than a million pounds within the first year. And these days it's only got 750 grand left less than a million pounds the latest accounts show i mean over the years lots of money's coming i think it's been over three million that's coming and gone out and they put themselves 
on the board of directors and took the money. Initially, it was for the like the reason for the fighting fund existing. So when you start like a charity or something like this, you know, you have to state your reasons. You have to have um, what they call them treasurers and stuff like that. So I don't know the exact ins and outs of the law of when they started the fund, but they started this fund. It was in conjunction with the news of the world, and they put more than a million pounds in there within first like within the first few months it was huge and i'm sure it went over three million pounds at one when i say i'm sure i remember looking on the internet and seeing so you know that's my testimony uh, that it was over three million pounds at some point the information could probably be found out there at some somewhere and i remember looking into this and seeing that they put themselves on the board of directors i do want to just confirm uh madeline fund directors they put themselves on the board of directors yeah kate mccann and jerry mccann and they changed the title of the fund like what the fund was to the objectives here it is the full ob objects of the fund this is the actual fund web page uh, to secure and safe return of to her family madly i mccann to procure that madly i mccann's abduction is thoroughly investigated and now to provide support including financial assistance to madly i's family so they put themselves on the board and they made a little note there to say that they could have the money. And then they became millionaires, didn't they, basically? So Madeleine's gift, a way I try and reason this out myself, my conjecture, is that uh, Kate found Madeleine. We've done this in the previous videos, remember? So check back over these if you want to see the full story of the evidence that supports this, including blood spatters up the walls. Um, Kate found Madeleine in some kind of state of distress maybe attempted cpr on her it failed got jerry involved jerry said you're going to lose the kids you know this has been done now it's not your fault you're going to lose the kids and then you've got that strange passage from the bible that was uh, bookmarked talking about you know what happens after a child dies and uh talking about blame and god's place in it all and so i think he tried to convince kate that it wasn't uh her fault and that she should cover this up so as to not lose her other children and then when the money came in they sort of looked at it as a sort of a uh, gift from the heavens madly Ein's gift uh, you know madly Ein's died but she's looking over us from heaven look because she's made us millionaires so i think that's the story that jerry wants to uh, make sure they not present in public and stick to but he wants to make sure that's drummed into her head so that she doesn't go rogue and tell everyone what happened and they can carry on being millionaires so the issue here is he said, you know, you've got to put yourself in the mind of these people. What would you be like if it was you? Um, this is so beyond the level of when the perp uses the past tense in the TV interviews. Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, I was the director of a limited company. You never once took the director's benefit, which is legal from this place. All right. Um, I did, I'm self-employed, so I know a little bit, but I, like, I don't know as much as you then. Um, but I do know that initially, if you're not on the fighting fund as a director, and then you become a director, and then this little note is changed so that you can have the money, that that's fishy, isn't it? Uh, obviously, they've used the money to buy houses and pay for their kids' schools and stuff, haven't they? Anyway. I was thinking, uh, it's two, three, what is it? 20, 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11. It's four years later, you're a millionaire. You've met the Pope. Right, you've met, do you know what I'm saying? You've met the Pope. You've been around the world. You're on all these interviews. Uh, you're controlling your media image with your media team. And... Uh, sorry, I'm just going to literally have to deal with the dog. She was just in there booking. My, my mom's in there with him. So, um, Hello, Palumbo, new chatter. Um, keep reading what the objective is. Note the use of the word abductors and those assisting them. Yet they said she was abducted by one person. Abductors is plural. Good point. Good point. Um, yeah, I was sort of saying, just going on what I was trying to... I was trying to react to what he's... <laughs> I'm, I'm a right chuffer. I do enough talking. Um... There's a, I do enough talking. There's a reaction, my, my point is here. He said that you, what would, you put yourself in their shoes and you try and think what it'd be like if it was your child that was missing or that you'd accidentally found dead and murdered or whatever and accidentally put in the sea, like not being flippant, but you know, put yourself in their shoes. 
And the problem is, is that I can't put myself in their shoes because I haven't spent four years spending millions of pounds going around the world creating a media image to try and live up to. Do you know what I mean? Like, like they've create, they've got this media team, news of the world, lawyers. They've got millions of pounds in the fighting fund. They've met the Pope. I don't think I can put myself in their shoes. I think, like, their shoes are a very strange fit. And I think her face, and we're going to go, come to the actual interview and just watch the whole interview in a second, but her face is one of extreme stress, anxiety. I think she's on some sort of drugs. Like, her, her pupils are so dilated. They're either massive flags, red flags, or then this eye is looking off on its own over here. Like, almost, like, disconnected. There's, like, this, like, split down the middle of her face. I don't know if she's got the Bell's palsy. I'm not joking about this because she looks fucking weird in this. And it's also symptomatic of heavy drug use. That is, like, these disconnected eyes, the, the um, pupils. Like, I don't know how much cocaine they're snorting. I don't know what they're doing. They're millionaires. They're going around the world. They've got media teams and lawyers. And it's four years later. So it's difficult to infer some of these things. But he's going on the, the script. He's going on the written words. So... He is pulling out some quite interesting stuff. We also see that it's edited. So the script is from the edited version. So we have to be careful about some of these things as well. But um, she's got the thousand yard stare. She's fucking, she's got something not going on or not going on or gone, hasn't she? She's got, she's got a thousand yards, some fucking thousand light year stare, that one, isn't it? She's seeing all the way to the fucking end of the earth and back. And she, she can see through the, the bottom of a black hole. That's what, two, two black holes, right? I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on, but let's carry on. Statement analysis deals with what one tells us. It also deals with what one doesn't tell us. When parents of missing children have no involvement or no guilty knowledge of what happened to the child, their focus is on what the child is experiencing now. Does she have her favorite blankie? Does she have her teddy bear? Does, is someone looking at her warm smile? Are they kissing her? Is she scared at night? They are consumed by these thoughts. These people are speaking as if they have already processed something, which is her death. It's been 1,543 days since Madeleine McCann vanished. To keep Madeleine's case alive, this private couple has revealed more of themselves than ever before. Kate and Jerry are both doctors. They married in 1998 and in 2001, after three years of failing to conceive naturally, they began IVF. 18 holiday. I'm skipping on from the news stories, you know, breakdown of the past. Madeline Stoversee's holiday as a family and they went with three other couples. Jerry, we're on holiday. It's a small resort. It was out of season, end of April, beginning of May, and it was incredibly quiet. Um, we felt very relaxed there, very relaxed. A couple of things about that is we like to hear people speak for themselves how they felt, um, not for we. Then we look at anything that's repeated. So we have the word relaxed, repeated, we have the word very repeated. So very relaxed, very relaxed, and not for himself, Jerry, but for both of them speaking. Okay. Um, so if they're speaking together, that's appropriate. They're now speaking, he's now speaking of their emotion together, and that's not always so usual. And that points me towards and this idea that Jerry's the one leading the narrative, that Jerry's decided how the story is going to go down and he leads that story. They are telling us how very relaxed they are. This is narrative storytelling. This is setting a scenario, we call it the normal factor. If you take a seven-year-old child and you say to the child, once upon a time, on a day that was just like every other day, the child will sit up knowing that what's about to happen was unlike any other day. Mm -hmm. That's called the normal factor. If someone says, I'm a normal man, what they're saying to you is, Either they themselves or someone else has said, you're not normal. It's unnecessary. Well, here, what we call this as a need to persuade that this was a normal day is telling us he knows it's anything but. That's storytelling. That's, that's when um, those in law enforcement will say, I feel like they're storytelling 
they're actually narrative building. They're bringing your emotions into an account. Instead of saying, my daughter's missing. I don't know what she's experiencing. I don't know who she's looking at. I don't know if they're giving her her medicine. With that urgency, they are, not only did they wax nostalgic, but now they're allowing you to enter into their emotions. And I want you to make sure that you understand my emotions were very relaxed. Interesting is that they've got this media team around them, isn't it? So when it comes to the automatic narrative decisions that a human might make when they're telling you these things, uh, we've now got to take into account that there are people that are, their job is to manipulate people's feelings with media and they're telling them what to say. Now that's actually happening to the McCanns. They've got the media team and they're telling them, you know, that's, so I think some of these things might have come from a media team saying, right, this is your statement. When they say this, this is what you should say. And that's why some of this narrative storytelling stuff comes through as well, because I think that the narr like that's the, the, the voice of the, of the, I don't want to say journalist, because they're not really like journalists, are they? These news of the world, Daily Mail people, but, um, you know, that's the voice of the writer coming through, isn't it? So at some point you say, wow, you sure seem to need to convince me. Um, an idea that spouse abuse and chance to split, I do, I, I do quite, quite think that Kate is very put upon by Jerry and that Jerry has called certain shots. But I also think, again, talking about splitting up, like you're both uh, dependent on the other to not confess. Like if either of you goes rogue and says what really happened, then like assuming that something bad happened, then the other one's in the shit because you're the one that confessed and you can put them in the shit. So I think they're both uh, tied to each other now in the same way as Madeline probably had something tied to her when she was thrown in the sea. Uh, they were, but they're both tied to each other now, is is the truth, isn't it? And the the money, the um, the plot, the position they're in now, uh, but I do think that she kicks back. I do think that she has an opinion and does some screaming and yelling, you know, behind closed doors. But I think that they, like she, ha she it's not that she has to concede to Jerry, but she does have to concede to Jerry because he's come up, in my opinion, with the plan with the, the narrative and she's having to go along with it. But also I think she kind of agrees with it in ways because I think the moment that she either found her daughter dead or was in, instrumental in her death, like, I think that kind of broke something inside her and she feels incredibly guilty for it. And yet her husband has convinced her that the worst thing she could do would be to confess because then she will lose her other children and they need their mom. So she's, bit, she's um, like her responsibility in her mind lies to her children first, maybe her husband a little bit and to herself a little bit, but to those children first and to Madeline, but Madeline's dead. So she has to say to herself, just like that passage in the Bible, well, she's fucking dead now, I'm gonna eat. So that's in Samuel, it's describing, a. Uh, we looked at it in the previous episode where uh, Jerry had marked, or someone had marked a passage in the Bible and it was on the, the desk next to her bed next to Madeline's shrine and uh, it said that uh, was it Saul anyway, this, this fellow was sad because his kid was poorly and he was like please God can you fix my kid and I'm not going to eat I'm fasting I can't sleep my kid's poorly and then the kid died and uh, he just like fuck it I'm going to eat start eating I'm not going to I can sleep now and they said what's going on when you were, when you were worried for your kid when you were worried about them you couldn't eat you were so anxious uh, you know you couldn't eat now that they're dead, all of a sudden you're fine and you can eat. Now, shouldn't you be grieving now? And he said, no, now they're dead, they're with God and that's it. Like, you know, before I was hoping that God could do something for them. I was worried about them, but now there's a line drawn. They're with God and that's it. So I can eat because I love God and I know that they're with God. That's it. I got, I'm moving on quick. That was the story in the Bible. Honestly, bookmarked next to her bed, found by the police, head of police from the Portuguese investigation. So... It's this idea that even God, even God wants you to behave in a certain way, Kate. And if you're broken and confused, like imagine you, like when you say put yourself in these people's shoes, which is the suggestion from uh, Peter Hyatt, I could put myself in those shoes, like being completely mentally broken. Like I, I've had real upsetting times in my life at times. 
And I remember once when I was like, just sort of kneeling on my bedroom floor, crying into my hands. And I had to say to myself, look, if you don't pull yourself out of this and stand up and like, you know, go and wash your face and sort yourself out, no one else is gonna, and you, you can't cry forever. So um, there are times in life where you go through these really stressful things. And if someone else was in the room saying to you, God wants it this way, fucking your husband's, you know, gonna pull the shit and you know, I, I don't know, and like you sort of go along with it. And then things spiral out of control. You end up on the fucking telly. You end up a millionaire. You've met the Pope. Now, I think she's just, like, like we said about the thousand yards there, I think she, yes, is being, when you say spousal, spousal abuse, I think we could veer into those conversations. But I think also, like, she's like the broken shell of a person being um, puppet stringed by three or four different people all sorts of and at the same time they're all very careful not to let her break and explode you know they're kid gloves a little bit because you know do you need anything you, maybe you need a few more sedatives because like you know if she goes rogue if she explodes it's all done so like there's a bit of care given to her as well um and imagine like you're you know mentally broken you're going through like what seems like a ludicrous situation becoming a millionaire meeting the Pope all this weird shit and uh, like you couldn't imagine I don't think a human being could get hold of the threads of what you know they can't get back down to earth that easy can they like she must be living in some sort of cuckoo dreamland like what the fuck is going on so whilst spousal abuse potentially yes but also I think Jerry just being the strong hand the guiding hand you know you're married uh, they're religious, they believe in God and principles of marriage. You know, he's the husband and he's got these quotes from the Bible. You might just go along with the guiding forces in your life because you're otherwise adrift on a raft of broken emotion. So um, you might just accept that steering hand and it might not be hard to, it might not be like, you know, you have to be hit and hidden. It might just be that you go along with it because the alternative for her is to reveal in public the truth of what happened to her daughter and destroy everyone's life again. So she, you know, like she kind of wants to do that. You can see it in her. She wants to do it, but she doesn't want to do it. Uh, so maybe you don't even have to like you know do much coercing to to Kate. Maybe she doesn't like. Maybe there is coercion going on. My my contention is there is, but maybe she doesn't require much <laughs> because you give someone who's desperate a, a, a different option and they might grab hold of it even if it doesn't seem like the best option. So we'll, we'll get to them in a second. ...that it was a normal relaxing day. Why do you have to convince me of that? In the evening, the children were put to bed by half past seven before the adults had dinner together down at the pool. From where they ate, Kate and Jerry could see the back of their apartment. We know this stuff. And Palumbo, yeah, uh, we looked at the, um, in previous episode on the channel, we've been looking at, I'll put, I'll put it together as a playlist now after this episode. Uh, we've been looking at the book they tried to ban, which was written by the lead Portuguese detective. And he outlined some of these um, points about inconsistencies, changing of the, the, the statements by the other witnesses. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Agree. And left the. I think it's only 50 meters. If you measure it directly from the back of the apartment, it's a straight line to where we're dining. It's only 50 meters. Yeah, if you do that, it's only 50 meters. But of course, it doesn't matter because there's loads of tarpaulins up and you can't see it. So, like, it's only like 50 meters from here to the inside of my neighbor's house, but I can't fucking see it. Like, you know, I can't get in. I'm not going around there. If. if like, you know, if, if two doors down, they're doing something weird, I don't fucking know, do I? If, like, over there, if I point out my window now, I can point down to the opposite of the road over there. Like, I can't, I can't see what's happening. <laughs> I wouldn't leave my kids up there. Does. Uh, that's a dead eight line 49.4 on Google, if you want to be really specific. 49.4 on Google, if you want like, Is that something she's done? Is that something that Kate's done? So I'm doing my analysis now. I need to let them explain their analysis first and then we're going to do my analysis. But is that something she's done? I measured it on Google or is it something someone else has done and given her the data? You know, this is the... If someone asks you, right, well, it's only 49.4 on Google. So like, you know, it feels like that's the sort of information that might come up from a research team that is part of your media team. Now, I can't imagine Kate being on Google, Google mapping the exact... I just can't imagine it. But then again, I'm imagining someone lost in a world of confusion, either looking for their daughter or 
trying to cover up the death of their daughter, so I don't know. Okay, now, one would say, in defense of them, is that, hey, they've been accused of neglect. And they're defending themselves, so much to the point that Kate went online and Googled it and found out exactly the distance that it was away. There's a problem with that, however. She's missing. I expect them to talk about not defense of themselves, but concern for her right now, at this moment of the interview. It's not there. But Statement it's, analysis deals with what one... I do have a problem with this. It is four years later. Like, even if you are worried about... I mean, the contention would be that you're on an interview and they're asking a question about this and you might say, look, I don't fucking care how far away the apartment was. It's fucking four years later. She's now looking this tall. She's, her hair's probably down to here or she might have had it cut. Uh, remember, she's got this thing on her eye. Like, if anyone's seen her... She could be anywhere in the world at this point, like, you know, obviously, I don't know about that, but, like, you know, they used this global campaign as a smokescreen, didn't they, so that there were so many leads coming into the into the police investigation. Oh, hello, this is the police from Adley I. McCann. Oh, she's in Brazil, is she? Oh, hang on, there's another call. Hello, this is the police from Adley I. McCann. Oh, she's in Germany, is she? Oh, hang on, there's another call. Oh, hello, this is the police from Adley I. McCann. Oh, she's on the fucking moon with Lord Lucan, is she? Hello, there's another call. Like, it, it, it confused and clogged up the investigation so it, it was a negative but uh that did happen like uh for you to be on telly four years later to be doing the interview and to be showing these like the, the symptoms or uh, symptoms like the behaviors that he's describing are more in line with people who are recently affected by the crime i would say like even four years later you'd still be looking for your daughter but things would be different wouldn't they You'd have done four years worth of looking. You'd have had to accept certain things in your life. You'd have had to move on in certain ways, even though you really wouldn't want to. There are certain things that you'd have to just sort of say, look, she might, we might never find her. At this. After four years, you might have had those conversations. So to say that you would behave in the same way as you would behave expected of someone who's recently through the system, I don't know. I, I think it's hard to say that at this point. It says, and what one doesn't say, now we're being given a lot of detail about the distance. Before, I was given a lot of detail about what Madeline was like. I've not heard yet a single detail about what Madeline's experiencing in the hands of strangers. But the proximity was very close. I mean, that's difficult as well. It might be the edit, because it might be the, let's say, we sat down for the interview. Oosh. Okay, so when Madeline went missing, I, and they, Jerry comes straight in, I want to know about fucking all these pedos around the world who have got my daughter. I want to fucking, you know, this fucking pedo's got my daughter. And, uh, 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 and, like, and then uh, he calms down a bit and like, you know, whatever. And he has a glass of water and they're like, okay, right, I'll answer your questions now. And like, he goes on and answers the questions. They might just edit off that first bit of him ranting about pedos because it might not make good news copy. I mean, it might make better news story. It might be a better news. Well, for this particular show, they're investigating the night of what happened for the Australian audience a few years later. They don't want him to go ranting on about conjecture about pedos that's going to get them legal trouble. Like he might have like, you know, he could be on there going fucking Prince, Prince Andrew's a pedo and he fucking took Madeline. And then they could say, well, we're not putting that on the broadcast because look what he said. So let's cut that off because we, we can't deal with the legal implications. So we're looking at an edited version of, a, of an interview. So it, again, it's hard to, state that they categorically haven't done that. This is um, insightful because, first of all, the word but will refute what just preceded it. I do apologize sometimes. Sometimes he's peaking in the sound and if I try and turn it up and down all the time, it's really difficult because he leans down and talks into his microphone. So sometimes it's peaking, but um, I hope the sound's all right for you and I hope the balance is all right. Let me just... Sometimes he's peaking in the sound, and if I try and turn it up but and this down is all insightful. the time, it's really difficult because it leads down to one, two, one, two, check, check, one, two, one, two, check, check. Sometimes it's peaking. To answer this but, question for me. Um, I hope the sound's all right for you, and I hope the balance is all right. Let me just... Sometimes he's peaking in the sound, and if I try and turn it up but and this down is all the time, it's really difficult because it leads down to one... Yeah, it seems all right. One, two, check. I mean, I don't listen to myself live while I'm doing it. I can't hear my own voice with a slight delay on it. It annoys me, and I don't... I can see it on the monitor, but obviously if I monitor it, it's a little bit... I'll shut up now and let this go. Who are they most concerned about? Are they most concerned about Madeline or about themselves? How can they not be concerned about Madeline? How could they even care? They should be really accusing themselves of neglect. 
The fact that they don't accuse themselves of neglect but are justifying themselves tells you something else. So this is interesting and we will use this particular point when we look at the earlier interviews if we can find any because they should be accusing themselves of neglect. They should... I get what he's saying. Oh my God, where is she? Oh, I should have, I could have, like, if only I'd, it's those sort of thoughts, isn't it? It's those sort of thoughts. I think they probably went through her head at the time when they were trying to resuscitate her. And he's already said to her, look, you're going to have to fucking shut those out right now. Like Jerry being a cold surgeon, like she's a GP, I think, but he was a surgeon, wasn't he? So Jerry being a bit more cold and clinical, I can imagine him saying like, you know, yes, agree with all your thoughts here, wife, but like, it's not going to bring her back. So fucking get that out of your head. You could have shielded her. You didn't. She's dead. This is what happens in the operating theatre. Oh, I could have fucking got it. I don't sit there and think about all the fucking people that I operated on. They, they've been in. They're through the mill. They're gone. Like, you, you have to be cold and clinical about this. And I don't think she has been able to remove it from her brain. But I think that's the concept there. And that's why in the early interviews as well, I don't think that they seem to be self-deprecating in that way. Even though I can understand any parent being like that. Even if she had gone missing, I could still imagine Jerry being that um, bombastic as to say, well, I didn't fucking, I should have. Not I should have. No, you should have. No, everyone else should have. And, and that attitude being like a protective thing that she has taken on, like, uh, I'm not going to speak publicly about what I should and shouldn't have done because uh, there's nothing I can do about it now and it makes me fucking depressed. And, you know, I think it's been worked in as part of this narrative that Jerry's told her to, to abandon that concept of you should have, you could have, you would have and instead to look at the reality, which is that you're now a millionaire. Not only do we not have concern for Madeline, we have concern for self. Why would you be concerned for self? So then the part one, this has been three 45 minute segments and this video here is them stitched together. Do you know what, I think we'll carry on with it instead of me abandoning this to, to look at, but we'll look at their actual interview a bit first. Now in context, We've got this now in context, like the whole thing. So we'll look at this, then we'll go back to those explanations of what we've been seeing and hope they don't overlap too much. And then, then she and then. opened her mouth and <laughs> the whole world knew she was uh, with us. But... She had McCann level volume, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> I'm just going to pause that there. I'm going to do some body language analysis, hopefully, but it's a very difficult video to body language analyse, isn't it? But uh, one another, another thing I would just like to analyse here quickly is I don't know much about their arrangements before Madeline died. I don't know even if this is their house, but it looks very neat and tidy, doesn't it? There's some bags on the floor here. I imagine they're either in or out on the way, these bags here. The children are gathered at the base of the stairs. There's a stair gate. The stairs look immaculate, white paint. I'm not seeing like scribble marks of crayons. I'm not seeing like toys lying around on the stairs. I'm not seeing finger marks of like, you know, jam sandwiches. I'm seeing a lovely stone floor in the kitchen area there. I think that's the stone floor in the kitchen. I imagine they're quite well off, both being in the medical profession. Uh, big flagstones in what looks like a lovely kitchen. Again, I'm not seeing loads of toys or anything cluttered anywhere. It's a very tight shot, so I can't see a lot of it but uh, their house looks spick and span. Now, that's okay, isn't it? That's fine. Doing a good job of, of the housework is fine. Um, uh, sorry, I, I'm not keeping up exactly on chat there, but I do remember about Jamie Bowles, yeah. Um, I do. Uh, I don't exactly remember how the parents reacted, but I do remember the case. I was quite young as well. I think not quite young, but I was younger at the time, so... I'd, um, and we didn't have all this media coverage of, of it as well. Um, yeah, this emotionless thing. I'm sorry about the, the way your, um, your dad does that in your life. Like, I recognise it in my life from some people as well. Like, uh, sometimes people just, I, I think as well, sometimes they can't cogitate the emotion, that like they're having trouble with it. So if they need to relay information, like they just need to relay information. Uh, they decide that the emotion is less important because you need to hear this information. If they allow the emotion to come in, they themselves will have an emotional reaction and they don't want to burden you sometimes or 
trouble you. Like It's like people who can't deal with their emotions feel that no one else can and it shouldn't be dealt with and it should be hidden away in some way. Do you know what I mean, maybe? Um, my dad was of a generation where it was more like, you know, you should be tough. So maybe they just think that just being... Like, maybe it's like a problem that once you try to bottle things up in yourself, then you behave differently, and then people, you know, don't like that. And then you've got a problem because you've already bottled stuff up and you can't really access it that easy to then start pulling it out and saying sorry. So um, it becomes a like ever-increasing problem. Um, but I'm not saying that like, people who do that are, are right. I'm just saying, like, do you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I'm saying stuff. Um, but yeah, it's all difficult, isn't it? Um, for this, analysis I'm doing here I just wonder I do just wonder it's all one well and good and it is lovely to have a lovely home and to keep it clean and everything but I know people who've got kids I've been kids you know and it's also fine to have a bit of mess around the place because Christ three kids <laughs> and I think there is a bit of a funny interplay between maybe a couple who have this prim and perfect you know maybe uh, a wife who wants to keep the place spotless. I know. Uh, uh, do you know what I mean? I, there's like a, an edge to that, which is that you have to sort of bully the kids into not being kids in some ways. And here they are sat on the stairs with gated stairs, which is for their own safety. But, uh, you know, I, I see a bit of a, like the, the clothes all look perfect, don't they? Maybe they're dressed up to go to a party or something, you know, but I don't see any stains, smudges, or like even the hairs, like the hair is all neat and tidy. Um, is that a strict household? That's my question. You know, that's my question. It's, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what that to infer from that, really. I'm just, it's there as a picture, and I've just talked about it. Let's sing another one. I always wanted to be a mother. Um... Here, she says, I always wanted to be a mother, but she shakes her head. Hey, well done. Okay, let's sing another one. I always wanted to be a mother. Um, I don't know if maybe that stemmed from being an only child and sort of, you know, one. It's a very strange little micro expressions but again it's edited and uh it's like kate it, i don't know about bass lines i mean she's just hard to read at times and then other times she thinks she's really easy to read this is one of those hard to read times she said i really want to be a mother and she shook her head and then look at this smile but then there's a like that's an inquisitive look a questioning look like these are micro expressions as well so they, they happen quickly, which means that the brain is automatically doing the expression. And then you're coming in with your like conscious thought to, to uh, edit, like self-edit, because you know, you're on camera and should you have done that? So this inquisitive expression to me is about herself. Like she's questioning her own facial expression and behavior and thought process before evening it out to something more media polished you know, emotionless while she continues. And there's a bit of a jump there with the, the video, so it's hard to, you know. Um, but here, we're getting a sort of condescending sneer, like you've smelled a bad smell. When you see these lines on the face here come up, like you've smelled a bad smell, that's a bad look, it's condescension. So, you know, it's an interesting collection of, it's not a, a a cluster of body language that I can really say she's doing this, but it's a collection of contrasting things going across her face. Hey, well done. Okay, let's sing another one. I always wanted to be a mother. Um, I don't know, maybe that stemmed from being an only child and sort of, you know, wanting that feeling of family. I wonder, and I'm just, you know, I've watched this loads of times and done loads of different thoughts about this, but not on the internet, but um, I, and this is just off the top of my head here, but I wonder, she describes herself as being an only child. And I wonder, when you're describing yourself as being an only child, you're not thinking of yourself on your own at home alone, are you? Like sitting, watching the telly, I'm an only child. What you're thinking, oh, hello, uh, Lou. Um, dropping some interesting information in the chat there. Uh, I'm not gonna, again, I, I, I don't know about that, so I'm not gonna sort of, dig into it right now while I'm talking about this, but it's there immortalized on the chat. So if anyone wants to search it up and have a look, interesting stuff, thanks for bringing it to the table. Um, that's cool. Um, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if she's, um, I wonder if she's reflecting on her own childhood. 
and therefore thinking about her relationship with either one of her parents or both of them and the i like there's something there's just something strange about that isn't there to be smiling wistfully maybe or cheek like maybe she got her own way a lot or you know she had control over one of her parents or maybe she's got daddy issues i don't know what it is but I just wanted to be a mother um i don't know if maybe that stemmed from being an only child and an only child and that's where the smile came from is her being an only child and sort of you know wanting that feeling of family and then she described it as wanting that feeling of family so she was saying that being an only child therefore she was lonely and the reason why she wanted to have kids is because then she uh, in later life can replicate what she wanted which was siblings it's a very like, it's a very strange thing to be saying really isn't it in this interview i'm from being an only child and sort of you know wanting that feeling of family but also, she stutters over the word feeling. I always wanted to be a mother. Um, I don't know if maybe that stemmed from being an only child and sort of, you know, wanting that... F f feeling. Feeling. And she spits it out, feeling of... Family. Family. So it's an interesting choice of words, isn't it? Because you've grown up, you've got married, you've had three kids, one of them that you've murdered on holiday and dumped in the city. I, I mean, just conjecture. Um, but one of them that's sadly passed away. Like, anyway, like you're four years later, you're a millionaire. You've been on world tour and you've met the Pope. So it's all gone a bit strange. I can't really put myself in your shoes that easily. But uh, when you're describing the fact that when you were an only child, you were on your own essentially. Therefore, you wanted to have lots of kids so you could have a feeling of family. But it's not a feeling of family. It's actually having a family, isn't it? So I could have that family. Like feeling a family, family, or maybe your family didn't provide a feeling of family. It's, maybe it's semantics, but uh, she kind of stutters over the word. And the first thing that would probably come to mind is family, isn't it? So that I could have that family. I could, and you get time to think about it because you're stuttering on the word. So, uh, so I could have that family, you might say. But she doesn't. She goes with feeling of family, which would imply that in some way what's happening in the reality of her world you know, he's not connected, like feeling a family and actually family is a bit different, isn't it? It's a bit different. It's like a, a replication of family or a, a, uh, an idea of a family. Like, so there's an incongruence there with like the reality of what she was living and her hopes for her feelings, I think. I don't know if maybe that stemmed from being an only child and sort of, you know, wanting that feeling of family. And then they edit it. <laughs> Madeline was the daughter Kate and Jerry McCann always wanted. For years, Kate struggled to fall pregnant, so when Madeline came along, they felt blessed. Sitting by the pool uh, with myself and my both got her feet just paddling, and she's so happy. It's been 1,543 days. Take care of themselves. Kate and Sal began Kate yeah, the doctor and pregnancy test. A little line appeared on the test. You know, I'm a doctor and it says on the box, any kind of line is a positive, but I was like, oh, I'm not sure, not sure. But there was that faint kind of... It's hard to read. Again, you're only getting a close-up of her head and we're talking about something a bit strange here, like the conception of Madeline. Like, it's a bit strange to be... I don't know. The line appeared on the test. You know, I'm a doctor and it says on the box, any kind of line is a positive, but I was like, oh, I'm not sure, not sure. But there was that faint kind But. I do see that she's looking across and away. Either uh, you might look at the neurolinguistic programming of her thinking, but she could also, like, I don't see what's off camera, but quite often in the interviews, she refers to Jerry, like he sat next to her and like she kind of looks at him to check that either she's delivering things in the right way or he's approving or disapproving. You know, she's like checking Jerry quite often. Kind of. And when he talks, she seems to be, like they both do this to each other in the interviews, which we'll see coming up, uh, is that, when one of them talks, the other sort of monitors them. Uh, it's a very interesting thing they do. Showed it to me and I'm like, it's definitely. <laughs> it's definitely. Yeah, you see, she looked at Jerry then, he came in. So, I mean, he is part of this story too, but maybe she was 
maybe when you've told this story a number of times, he you you know you go through a sort of routine and he usually starts piping up about now so maybe she was expecting jerry to start talking and maybe he was a bit more reserved because he's on telly but then he thinks oh, i'm going to say my bit now this is where i say my bit so it's almost like she's expecting jerry and she does that with not a face of joy or delight sometimes like there is a is it a genuine smile i mean it's very hard to read what's going on four years later when you're a millionaire and you're asked about the conception of your daughter that is now probably dead like, it's a fucking weird thing to try and think how the body language would respond, isn't it? But <laughs> it says on the box, any kind of line is a positive but I was like, oh, I'm not sure, not sure. But there's that faint kind of... Showed it to me and I'm like, it's definitely. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's definitely. Like... <laughs> no question. He's got a big, broad smile, though. Hasn't he? Like, I don't see any of the... Uh, with Kate, you see this sort of internal conflict playing across her face, but with Jerry, it seems a lot more simple. Like, you just don't give a shit. Uh, and obviously, we had a scan, and uh, there was a little beaten heart, and that was our little Madeline, you know, so... That was our little Madeline. That was. Again, we're looking at the, that past tense use of language. That was our little Madeline. And there's this face, in my opinion, of resignation and true sadness across the eyes can't be hidden. They've dropped, you know true sadness and this time we're seeing these lines but not in that sneer the nose isn't coming up but she's pulling her lips pursing her lips back and that could be a sign she doesn't want to say something she's holding back reserved not wanting to say something she's definitely covering her teeth she's not smiling you know this is not a a, a, a positive sign is it when we're referring to madeline oh, of course she's been missing for four years so you could argue that she's resigned in her own mind that Madeline might not be coming back. And maybe that's that face, but, you know, they're the questions I'm asking. Who's that present for? That's for Auntie Claire. Are we going to post it today? No. We are. This is the house again. And remember what I said before about children and toys and mess. Hmm. Who's that present for? And it's easy to focus on Madeline in these things, of course. It's easy to do that. What I see here that I'm a bit surprised by, again, is this, it, it's so neat and tidy. Like I've got friends, they've got a box of toys like that. They've got a young kid down the road, my mate, and they've got a little table like that and all that, but there's, there's more stuff everywhere because you can't help it because the kid's always playing with it. Like Madeline here has obviously been playing with this ball, maybe, just, just that. But why is it so tight? Even the, ta the coffee table, I don't know anyone who's got a coffee table. I mean, they've got a cup out. Someone's got their sunglasses out. Madeline's got is that a toy car. It, that's it. Where's all the other stuff? The magazines, the newspapers, the, you know, the bits and pieces. It all seems really clean and cleared. And to be looking after and raising a young child and to keep the house all this, this tidy in every instance that I'm seeing, I find it quite a feat. Uh, I just wonder about that, what it says. I'm not going to read too much into it because it's okay to be neat and tidy and keep your house tidy, isn't it? But uh, it seems like quite a, a job of work compared to most people I know who do their best, but, you know, you might still find a Lego here or, you know, a uh, a couple of newspapers out there. or Do you know, do you know what I mean? I don't know. Um, why can we watch these very private videos of their children? Why, yeah, oh, absolutely, because they sold them, didn't they? They sold them for the money. That's how we can watch these videos, is they sold them for the money. The rights got sold to the companies that run the funds that... Uh, in your house, it's dog toys everywhere. Yeah, exactly. I don't even have kids and I've got things everywhere in my house. So, like, God help me if, <laughs> if I had to try and keep a kid's mess tidy as well. Um, it, it plays two ways as well. It might just be nothing. But, uh, but even if it was just that someone was keeping the house nice and tidy. Like I say, I think that's a stressful job of work for somebody. So I think that Kate might be, or if it's Jerry that's doing it, one of them might be feeling stressed about the constant tidying up. I don't know. And remember what they said earlier about, hang on, my relaxing music's panned out. Remember what they said earlier about this chuffer, he said earlier that they might blame the child in some way. Like they might have to 
have in their mind that they're responsible. So they don't want to be responsible and be evil people. So instead they reason it out in some way subconsciously that the child in some way did some stuff that wasn't 100% good. And therefore, you know, I'm not completely to blame for what I did. They try and reason that through. So if we're saying that they've had a constant battle with Madeline over something as simple as keeping the house tidy, that could feed into that narrative, couldn't it? Are we going to post it today? No, we are. This is a letter. Who says uh huh? And you always see her well dressed. I mean, maybe they're only videoing and photographing her when she is well dressed and and smart and tidy, or when they're going on a special occasion or something. But you do always see her, you know, almost doll like, almost dressed. And people do this with their kids. Again, I'm not saying it's horrific. But, you know, treating them like objects, dressing them up like dolls. Oh, doesn't she look cute in that? And I, it's not because Madeline herself has said, I'd like to wear these clothes. Sometimes a child might uh, might put up some protest. Oh, I can't be asked. I don't want to do it. Uh, you know, I don't want to wear my smart trousers. I want to run around in the mud. I don't care about keeping my, my shoes clean. I want to run around in the mud. And then the parents are like, oh, I just bought you those new clothes. And you're fucking getting messy. And like, you know, these sort of... Um, I believe these sort of things could have come up if you are could, like more regularly uh, dressing her up and keeping her tidy and you know I, you know look at this you got white tights on or whatever they, they look pretty but within 10 minutes she's going to get some shit on them isn't she she's going to like drop some jam on it or whatever oh your new tights oh mommy just bought them and like you know I try and keep you looking nice and you don't care and you know I could see it causing some sort of conflict between them in some ways and that being a, an issue for Kate, you know, in some way, I, I don't know. I just I find it I find it strange to always see someone's like whenever you see the pictures of Madeline and whenever you see their house, it's always immaculate. She's always immaculate because if you go through the pictures of me and my sister when we were kids, like we're always in a mess, <laughs> and not because my mom was like my mom was always trying to keep us tidy and always trying to chase us around with the you know the hairbrush, but it just can't be done, can it? So. Um. Say yes, Daddy. Okay. And then, in May 2003, three became five. When she first saw the twins, she was just ecstatic. Absolutely ecstatic. He's talking about Madeline there. He must be talking about Madeline because obviously he's not talking about Kate. Um. And three, three became five. When she first saw the twins, she was just ecstatic. It's hard to read because we're just coming in midway through. He had a raise of eyebrows, which was a big standout micro expression. And again, we, couldn't, we can't see the clusters, but I'm going to judge this as worrisome, believe me look, raising of the eyebrows. She was just ecstatic. Like, was she? Could you imagine many like, like only child... Uh, now I'm getting another reflection on Kate Early. She said, Kate earlier said that she was an only child like, about herself. Well, Madeline was an only child, wasn't she? Until the twin, twins turned up. So Madeline was ecstatic at the twins turning up. Ecstatic is a big emotion. I'll tell you what, it's a big emotion. So ecstatic or hysterical, they sound quite similar as well. Static, sterical. The two words sound quite similar, don't they? Ecstatic hysterical so I don't know if he's just substituted a word there and surprised himself and given him the believe me look when he did it but the word ecstatic got a raise of the eyebrows she was just ecstatic and a shake of the head and then a swallow a dry mouth swallow as the stress of the, the lie goes through him uh, in my opinion she was just ecstatic absolutely and then what he also does is when someone's told a lie and they think that they're being judged or watched, then they don't want to be uh, emotive. Like when you're being normal and real, you can just be yourself, can't you? And you can make your expressions. But when you're trying to not give off something, then you stunt your expressions. So I see like real living expressions static. become stunted. Absolutely. And the top half of his head has like stopped moving and it's just his jaw doing the talking. So that to me shows some sort of holding back and repression of things. She's just ecstatic. Absolutely ecstatic. 
but it's very short, it's edited. I can't really do a lot with it, can I? Um, when narcissistic people become parents, that's a really good... What we do on this stream as well, we've got a new thing on our stream. This podcast, Thus. This episode of Thus, the first one, the pilot, there is a bit of a sound balance issue. And if it takes off and gets thousands of views, then we might eventually put it on its own channel. And when I do, I'll upload that again with the sound balance fixed. Or I might upload it again with the sound balance fixed in the next few days. Who knows? Depends on how much I can be asked to edit a fucking <laughs> two and a half hour video. But um, I talked to this uh, fellow called Dark Side Steve. He's my new co-host, guest, podcast friend. And Steve is a forensic psychologist. So we did talk about narcissism in that episode. If you can tolerate the sound mix being a bit off, you have to turn it down for me so that I'm not too loud. And then Steve might be a bit quiet, but it's just one of those things. Um, but uh, yeah, in that episode, we discussed narcissism. I will. I like what you've written there. I think that's a very interesting thing. The outcome when narcissistic people become parents. That could be a topic for a whole episode. Narcissistic parents. Because like, wow, yeah, what a concept. I hadn't really thought that through yet myself, but what an interesting concept. And it ties in then, doesn't it, that we've got all these pictures of perfection and records of the perfection, the videos of... This is the playroom, for Christ's sake. Even the buggies are lined up in a neat and tidy... Even the two little baby buggies, everything's been tidied up. They're allowed to play with the train set, but only the train set. Put everything else away in a neat and tidy... There cannot be a playroom in the country that has each item lined up neat and tidy? Or has Madeleine McCann got obsessive compulsive disorder? Obviously not. She's a child who's just messing about. It's the parents who are doing this, isn't it? Like keeping this rigid structure, even with the toys. Um, I don't know who she's playing with there. Is it one of the twins? Probably should be because that's what they're describing as she was ecstatic, but it's years later now. And uh, yeah, the idea that of narcissistic parents means that they would want to... Like these children are now part of their narcissism aren't they they're um they're maybe a trophy to go on display we've got perfect kids they don't even make a mess they're not fucking allowed to um i i get that i think that's an interesting you know interesting idea there that we could really like we could start with that and we could just discuss it for hours so I, i'm going to move on because otherwise we'll just discuss it for hours but it's a really good point It's Christmas. It's Christmas. She's saying Santa must have brought all these toys. Oh, I'm blessed, really, at that time. Have you ever seen a Christmas day with all the toys that neat? Have you ever seen a Christmas day with all the toys that neat? It's it's insane. I, I, the, where's all the Christmas paper? Where's all the mess? What's going on? So the family felt really Yeah, complete. even the strollers are lined up. That's, yeah, strollers, that's... You must, I'm not going to ask personal questions of you in chat. Like, you know, if you want to volunteer information, that's up to you. But I would suggest don't tell everyone on the internet where you live and what your zip code is. But um, in the UK, we call these uh, buggies, but strollers, yeah, they're lined up. That's impossible, isn't it? It's not possible. Like, it's Christmas Day, all the toys, and on the windowsill, every soft toy or plushie is lined up on the windowsill. Not possible if you've got children. <laughs> not, not on Christmas Day. Look, the, the, the Christmas stuff's on that. No one's allowed to play with the fucking thing. Don't touch it. Leave the Christmas stuff on it. We're making a video. I felt blessed, really, at that time. You say the family felt really complete. Mm. Yeah. We did feel incredibly lucky. Again, even in that, and I'm, I'm being picky, but that's the whole point. You say the family felt really complete. Yeah. Mm. There's a micro expression there. Like a flick of the eyebrows, flick, I don't know what you'd call it. Um, you know, there is a micro, what I'd say is there is a micro expression there and I find it hard to read. It's almost like shock. Is it shock? Yeah. A reset of the brain. Like first thought not acceptable. Wipe and restart. There's that. Yeah. We did feel incredibly lucky. And then she confirms it though, with her eyes closed as she turns to the camera. That's not, a, that's not necessarily a good sign. Like she's thinking it through. She's still talking, but she's decided to open her eyes 
and confirm it with a nod of the head and a half smile. Yes. Uh, so maybe she's had to come to terms with what she's saying in her own mind there. But we did feel incredibly... Like we again, talking as a group, talking as a couple, talking as a family. We. Um, but not talking for herself necessarily. So maybe she's slipped onto the approved party line there instead of saying what she's thinking. So I always get this about Kate. It's like a turmoil going on. Like, it's like watching someone think three things at once and then having to say the, the one that you've been instructed to. Yeah. Mm. We did feel incredibly lucky. Um, or maybe she's got her own internal conflict. Again, we've got this living space. We've seen it before. Now there actually is more stuff on the table, look, that I would expect to see. There's a bunch of toys. There's some books underneath the table. There, there is a few more of these props because there are more children in the house now. There's the twins as well. Here's Madeline pushing one of these children in one of the toys, but there's nothing else around. And again, it's this almost like too perfect dress that she's got on, little shoes and that. Like um, She's almost dressed up like a doll. They've got the big rug. I suppose the big rug hides any stains but it does look very neat and tidy doesn't it still it's years on now the twins are starting to grow up like i wouldn't imagine anyone to have twins toddlers and a madeline running around and to keep it that neat and tidy but yeah that's some thoughts about that we're going to go back to the uh the embedded confessions for a little bit and we're coming up on one hour 20. We'll probably run to about two hours and then adjourn and come back. Uh, I'm doing this today specifically on a comment. Dan, Danny G, if you're watching this, Danny, here's the next video. Sorry. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm consistent but inconsistent. So expect more, but, you know, I'm not going to disappear for Christ's sake, but inconsistent but consistent. I stream a lot, for Christ's sake. <laughs> So uh, if you want to leave uh, comments for me, absolutely do so. Um, if you want to click like on this, it really helps. Make sure to do that, please. And we're going to crack on with a bit more embedded confessions. But I, I predict this will become a two, three-parter again. The, the word but I mentioned before, that should call your attention to what preceded it. And what Kate had said was 49.4 on Google. If you really, if you want to be really specific, and I asked the question, who would want to be really specific in this case? Well, the investigators would be. When a child goes missing, the parents, the innocent parents' brain never shuts off. This is why they don't sleep, not just the anxiety, but they replay everything in their mind due to a hormonal rush. The fight or flight hormone is, is elevated, it's up there. In this hormonal increase, their mind goes to detail, particularly when they try to sleep, they will often call the voicemail of a detective and say, I just thought of this and I just thought of that. I get that. I get what he's saying. You're so overwhelmed with these literal, not just feelings, because this is about mental health now, feelings, uh, the way you think, the way you behave and the way you feel are all connected. And even physical reactions in the body can cause you to feel a certain way which you then interpret as your your feelings, like not just physical feelings, but mental feelings, how you think uh, is then affected because you're affected by your emotions, you're thinking differently, and that can cause you to behave in a certain way. And it, like just relating it to mental health there, if you're feeling depressed ever, feeling depressed, then that's affecting your thinking and your behavior. And it's like an interplaying triangle. So I'm not going to judge any... I, I'm saying people feel depressed. I'm not judging you on feeling depressed. Absolutely, I feel depressed. You feel depressed sometimes. When you do, it's nice to remember that you've got a little stick that you can stick in the spokes of the turning wheel of that depression and say, hang on, I can't control how I'm feeling because I'm feeling this. Like it's, it's affecting me, but I'm thinking now. I'm thinking, not just feeling, but thinking. And I don't want to feel like this. And I feel like I can't stop feeling like this. The only thing left on that pattern of wheel that feelings thoughts is behavior and maybe i should stop like sometimes depression will make you behave in certain ways or you know cause you sometimes you have to say look i'm just going to do something different that i might not feel like doing like go for a run see some friends uh call someone up calling someone's always important you know talking to people um i might not feel like doing it because of the way i'm thinking and feeling but if you can get in and change one thing 
a behavior, then it can have a knock-on effect. You might feel differently, and then you can think more clearly, and then you can, like, so it's, it's this interplaying wheel of, of feelings, thoughts, and emotions. In this case, he's saying that if your child is missing, that is bang on your thoughts and your feelings and your and it's causing this hormonal rush and so late at night you're not asleep instead you're thinking every detail for me i would actually be out there with a hammer and a torch <laughs> like i don't think i'd be able to to settle like once my dog was lost and i had to go out roaming the woods you know with a torch i found him luckily um but i couldn't just sit at home and be like well you know i'll go out again tomorrow like, i'd have been out all night i'd have been out until i fell asleep in the fields and then woken up and carried on. Like, I, I found it very hard to understand in the early stages, Kate and Jerry. Um, I know that you're told by the police, you stay here. She might come back. You need to be here. You're going to help with the investigation. We need to talk to her. Oh, yeah, okay. Absolutely. But um, one of us can stay here and the other one can go down and fucking... I want to check the sea. I want to check everyone's fucking bins. I want to check, you know, whatever. I want to... I want to... I, be out and doing it i can't sit and twiddle my thumbs that's how i would have felt so um it is an interesting thing that he's saying of course we're talking four years on now we're talking they're millionaires now so um, we're, we're at a different place but they're describing things from the past so always on alert high alert here we have this type of high alert detail but not about madeline about um taking points in chat there just quickly as well um her aunt said Madeline used to hit her brother and sister. There might have been a rage problem. Uh, it was more normal in the UK, I think. I mean, it wasn't even illegal. So it was more normalised in the UK to actually strike children for discipline purposes. But uh, levels of and spectrum, you know, I don't know. Of course, it's now illegal and considered to be completely not acceptable. Um, but I was certainly struck as a child after the count of three. If you don't stop doing this, you are going to get a, a smack. And, you know, not like... a punch in the face but you know a disciplinary strike um and yeah so I, i'm not judging i'm just saying that it it was sort of more normalized at the time for people to do that um but yeah like it does it is a definitely indicative of a symptom of a like if she didn't have if kate didn't feel she had to smack her then she wouldn't have had to smack her if you know what i mean like if, if she wasn't having that conflict and and rage like you say and often I would argue that discipline can only be discipline if you yourself are disciplined enough to not be angry when you're doing it. So often a parent can lose their temper and smack a child and say that it's discipline, but because they're not disciplined, it's not really discipline, is it? So I'm not there, I don't know. Um, different for everyone. It's a good point to raise in chat as well, So, uh, but I, I can't judge it. Are justifying themselves. So with that, with that context, the context now is they are concerned for themselves. When a child goes missing, this is very personal to a mother and this is very personal to a father. No matter what, when a child falls, a father feels responsible. The father didn't protect the fall, even though he really has no reason to blame himself. We do that. It's just natural. We speak for ourselves. At this point, I am not comfortable with the word we here. We thought, because now he's entering into what she thought, and listen to his words, we thought, not I, but we thought that was the best thing, and then a pause, or a um, and it seemed to work, not fine, but absolutely fine. Then he says, we didn't have any problems. Now, when we ask people what happened, um, what happened is limited to a finite number of things. We're referring to before she went missing, missing, We're referring to before when they were putting her in the hotel room and leaving her there. And he's saying, we thought that was the best thing to do. It seemed to work absolutely fine. And we didn't have any problems right until the Thursday morning. And they will choose which is most important to tell us. Hello, when someone hello Morgan. Um, no worries. I'm glad it helped. I'm glad you're feeling better on reflection. Glad you're feeling better, so, uh, yeah, no worries. That's what we're here for. Tells us what didn't happen. Obviously, some worries. We've all got worries. That's the whole point. <laughs> but I'm glad that you're feeling better, yeah. What didn't happen is an infinite number of things. So when they tell us what didn't happen, we are on high alert now for very, very possible deception. I would also say, and I'm not going to, you know, 
I just say things because they come into my head, but um, I'm just person on the internet. I can't actually, like, I do try and reach out through the airwaves, so to speak, and um, offer solace and support. And we have got Mental Health Monday channel that you can look through and the old uploads are all here on Ganji Kid. Um, but uh, like, there's a limit to what I can do. So um, in the future, uh, the best advice that I was given, I suppose, was to go out and try and like meet people. I know it sounds a bit silly, just meet people, but like joining a club or um, reconnecting with old friends or like or whatever, you know, um, putting some some things into place so that next time when things start feeling difficult, um, I don't think I'd be the. It helps that I care. I don't think I'd be the only person to care. You see, and I think that. Um, I certainly advice. I mean, certainly advice that I felt was good um, was just to sort of try and. Uh, I used to go to see a therapist once a week to talk about things and she was very often saying, you know, maybe you should go and, you know, call that person or join that club or do some, you know, whatever. Um, and the more I interacted with real people out in the real, like, I am a real person, I am here, we are here. But, um, you know what I mean? Like, uh, just, uh, that's good advice too. Like when you're feeling better to sort of, you know, capitalize on it and um, have a little nose out in the world. Uh, Try and make those connections. Um, yeah, because I'm sure there are real people in your life that would also care, and that, like we just sort of, you know, let things drift a little sometimes. But anyway. And here's what we have. Until Madeline said, or when Madeline said, "Why didn't you come when we cried last night?" How old was Madeline when? Yeah, three, this? three, nearly four. Yeah. Sure as a parent, as a grandparent, and someone who taught parenting classes for years and years ago, children are by nature narcissistic. A child will say, when I cried, not we. The child is not going to show concern. Wow, this is big, isn't it? I mean, it is analyzing something that's said four years later, but why didn't you come when we cried? I didn't spot that, but yeah. Madeline would have said when I cried, so they're not telling us the exact truth of what Madeline said. At that age for, little babies unless two things unless the child is a little bit older five or six and the child is parentified meaning the, the neglect in the home has been so severe that the five or six year old is being the parent to others okay good point you know the child could feel responsible for those younger siblings and therefore talk in these terms we can't say that for madeline she wasn't being neglected was she she was if anything being taken care of to an extreme where she couldn't look untidy and you'll see this in child abuse cases where uh, a, a neglectful mother will say, look how she can cook her own meals on a little hands that should never be near a stove or an oven. Um, the neglectful parent is boasting about it. Well, here, Madeline did not express concern for others crying other than herself. She's too little to do that. It's when I cried. So at that point, based on that pronoun usage, as a professional analyst, I'm comfortable saying, this is not a truthful statement. You now think somebody had either tried to get into... So, yeah, you think nothing was said, but in fact they were crying. Um, when we looked over the um, testimony of the police detective, um, this did come up a little bit, but uh, I don't know if we came to any sort of firm conclusions. I think the conjecture that I would put forward is that there were issues with keeping the children calm at night and... Uh, some, I think the conjecture from the police detective was that some sedation had been used and it was said that if you stop giving children sedatives then they will have sleepless nights in the following weeks because they're so used to being sedated and that Kate said that the twins didn't sleep well after Madeline went missing which could be indicative that she stopped using whatever sedative she had been using because of course there were adverse reactions with Madeline so there are there are uh, um, there's circumstantial evidence to support that case and that what was said there was just not the case at all so the room or was in the room and woke them up the night before it, it just seems too much of a coincidence that she made that comment and then that happened that night yes what what is she's now doing is she's floating doubt for people see there's two different ways of analyzing that we're doing at the sort of same time. I'm trying to do the sort of body language analysis, like read the person. Room or was in the room and woke them up the night before. I, I, seems too much of a coincidence. 
Frown, shake of the head. She's dismissing what's being said. Incidents that she made that comment and then that happened that night. And then that happened. But what is what happened that night? That's what everyone wants to know, isn't it? So, interestingly, when she... Uh, more, uh, more people. Yes, what... Incidents that she made that comment. And that happened. That happened. Whatever happened, she has her eyes closed for this sort of extended duration of time, a little longer than you would normally, and there's a sort of stutter at the head, and it's that happened. I mean, it, it can, that is consistent with someone who's been through a trauma and doesn't want to revisit it, or is forced to revisit it through the initial thoughts that are going on in her head, and is closing her eyes and trying to, you know, jump out of it. That's consistent with trauma. You know, I couldn't say exactly what had happened, but certainly something traumatic seems to have happened because she's having trouble even facing it. Um, so I'm doing this sort of analysis. That comment and then that happened that night. Yes, what... what? And he's doing a slightly different analysis, isn't he? He's doing, I've got the script of what she said. I'm not watching the interview. I've got the script of what she said. And I'm going to break down her words. And that's really interesting as well because it's talking about, like, your words come from your brain, don't they? Like, you're making them up from this language that you've got choices within, but limited choices and concepts run by your brain. And this is where the subconscious and the um, self-identification self can really come through as well. So uh, the total analysis should be a combination of the two. Uh, yeah, we'll carry on. She's now doing is she's floating doubt for people. Mm. Floating doubt for people. Again, I think four years on, millionaires, media team behind them, going into an interview, you know what the questions are going to be. You do the prep, you've constructed your answers, the team have told you some things. They they might know, like, the, I don't know if Kate or Jerry understand, Kate, maybe not so much as Jerry, maybe Jerry does understand how to manipulate in this way, but certainly the media team, the Daily Mail, the News of the World, they write their articles in this way. That's how they construct these narratives in the public con consciousness by writing these articles, isn't it? So floating the doubt, it seems like a good, uh, a bullet point list that he's going through of things that you might do and uh, either you might do if you were guilty and trying to cover up but also you might do if you were a media person constructing a narrative and so I often think that these sort of inconsistencies might come from that preparation and that there might be someone else's answer to the question not necessarily Kate's own answer to the question and it could be Jerry or it could be the media team uh, it might not be I might be wrong, but I often think that. That she made that comment and then that happened that night. Yes, what, what is she's now doing is she's floating doubt for people. She's floating doubt. She, it, she's test and she's going to do it more, uh, more intensely coming up in a moment here. But she's allowing for people to enter into an emotion that doesn't exist. And this is very important in statement analysis. When we experience something that is emotionally charged, I once had a, a man point a nine millimeter gun at my head. We'll get, we'll follow up on that in just a second. Um, yes, you're right in chat. Amaral said that Kate phoned to ask the twins to be tested in August. Um, she offered the twins to be tested for sedatives at a point where she knew full well as a doctor, sedatives would not be in their system. That's true. Um, and the David Payne stuff, I think we briefly went over it over the Amaral stuff. Um, he is an interesting person, a uh, person of interest. <laughs> and uh, Richard Hall has done some videos on Payne and um, Robert Murat. And we're not going too deep into those characters. We're sticking pretty much on the videos and the, the testimony them, of the McCanns themselves. But yes, interesting points. As he was robbing someone. Um, I would also say that we've got to be careful to try and stick on the like when you get into David Payne and you get into Robert Murat, we're starting to go on to other stories in a way. And if we stick on the real hardcore focus of Madeline herself, what happened, the parents are obviously involved because they were the last people to see her alive. Uh, so they've got that involvement. They're a fucking parents. I like to stick with the close 
focus when we start to branch out and we start to say it could be this it could be that and there's 10 options and there's these shadows and those phantoms it becomes this big smoke screen and we get lost so um, i like to stick with anything that i can absolutely guarantee to say yes like this is their parents her parents actually saying this so um that's where we're going to stay with with my videos but agree on these interesting other side stories and avenues um covered by people like richard hall so in a drug robbery after it was over, I called police. He had a nine millimeter pointed at his head, he was saying. To make the report. I was fine. A couple hours later, I shook with emotion. Like, what just happened? The reason being, it takes time for us to process emotions. If I were to tell you a truthful account of what happened, it's not riveting. It would sound very boring. If I process all the emotions years later and I tell it a storytelling, I would say this. I once stood in the darkness, and when a man pointed the 9 millimeter gun at my head, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And I would tell a story to engage you into the emotions. We call that artificial placement of emotions. Editing, storytelling, narrative building. Um, by the way, I'm not sure if the, anyone is, is paying attention at this point. There's a missing child here that I've had no concern expressed for. Again, it's an edit, so I don't know if she didn't sit down and say, look, first thing we want to say is let's find Madeline. If anyone can help us find Madeline. And then they've done 40 minutes of her going on about expressing concern for Madeline before finally she shut up and they've got the bit they want for the edit. I don't know if that's the case, but um, I take his point. She's not, you know, she's not essentially showing concern for Madeline. This is why this interview jumped out at me. All right. Uh so I'm just going to skip back to the point he was making there um it seems too much of a coincidence that she made that comment and then that happened that night and he was saying that people create a narrative by um, putting a bit of their own emotion in at different times once they've had time to process and organize i'm saying it feels more like uh, a media media contrived answer um but i do want to say from what he was just describing there i want to go now to um Let's get one of these other windows. I've got loads, oh, more windows than Buckingham Palace, mate. Uh, I want to go to Madeleine... Madeleine... McCann first interview. Like, I want the first, you know, the very first, first earliest... So the first earliest I can remember was this on the steps outside. Tonight, Madeline's parents, Jerry and Kate, are still waiting desperately for news. Because we're looking for, he said, in the moment, you find it hard to process the, the emotion. And with every hour that passes, the questions only grow and the sense of dread mounts. They felt from the beginning this was a case of abduction of someone snatching their little girl as she was sleeping in their holiday apartment. So it is very bright lights and flashing and, you know, wind or whatever. But Kate, throughout this, she looks down and she looks like aghast to me. Like, I think it's like she can't even process or understand or, not understand, but process or like she shocked herself or has been shocked by her and Jerry and the whole thing. And like, I, I think she mirrors that finding it hard to process but in this i remember jerry seeming to speak more emotively uh, so we'll see anyway we'll see what we think and a short time ago they made this appeal what it annoys me that this has been uploaded to itv news the actual itv news and they haven't like the, the formatting is wrong this is squashed like it's elongated because it should be formatted differently they haven't done that they're a media production company and also, who's this man in the background? Is he part of the police or is he one of their media team? No, this or is he David Payne? I don't know, but there's a, you know, there's other people around, isn't there, that um, are involved in the crew here. These two are stepping forward to do the speaking, but there's obviously been some other people involved in the preparation of the idea that they're going to step forward and speak. Describe the anguish and despair that we are feeling as the parents of our beautiful daughter, Madeline. We request that anyone... He nearly said regret then. ...of our beautiful daughter, Madeline. He's holding that torch on his words, but 
it's very bright here. It's very illuminated. There's obviously video lights and photography. So he's got that torch because he thought he might need it, but it's pointed at, out at the cameras and the people. So it's almost a little bit like defensive aggressive in a way, holding that torch. Um, he's got his words, which he's going to stick to, obviously. He's got his arm around her. She's got her arm around him. Um, as she was sleeping in their holiday apartment. He doesn't look happy to be doing this. I mean, you wouldn't be, would you? You wouldn't be. You wouldn't be happy to be doing it. But, um... I don't know. I don't know. He almost looks, like, contentious. Like, you know... Um... Like he's facing down the media. They made this appeal. Words cannot describe the anguish and despair that we are feeling as the parents of our beautiful daughter, Madeline. We Kate here, like, he's like struggling, swallowing. She's just trying not to break down and cry. You can see it in her. Like She's obviously been right through the mill. The request that anyone who may have... Any and he moves away from her. He takes his arm off her and moves away. And it's when he says regret. He accidentally says regret. Anyone who may have any the anguish and despair I'll just let it play from the top and then I'll cut in sorry I think I've been breaking up too much she was sleeping in their holiday apartment and a short time ago they made this appeal words cannot describe the anguish and despair that we are feeling as the parents of our beautiful daughter Madeline we request that anyone who may have any information related to Madeline's disappearance, no matter how trivial, contact the Portuguese police and help us get her back safely. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy, brother and sister. This is home video of okay, Madeline. So that was... That was you know, the emotional first plea, wasn't it? When he says regret, he pulls away from her because I think he, he doesn't want, like, her... He's not... Well, he's obviously not trying to support her at this moment, is he? You know, putting his arm around her. He's trying to support himself and steady himself in his own words because he's putting his hand back on his words, on his pad. Uh, that's why he needs his hand. He fucked up the words and said regret, and so he grabs hold of the pad and, like, steadies himself, almost like a politician might, with, like, his speech and Kate is almost elbow to the side now so that's kind of like strange behavior in terms of compassion for your wife isn't it like almost elbowing her aside um, while he fronts the media down get her back safely please there's a big and a roll of the eyes before he says this next bit I mean he could honestly be going through the emotions couldn't he only I mean, is um, I, I think he is happier with the first piece of speech than the second piece. Now they've got the media people behind them. No matter how trivial, contact the Portuguese police and help us get her back safely. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy. Kate really... Like, there's something weird when he says, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her. Look. Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy. When he says mummy, it's like she looks away there. Again, we're looking at like tiny little things. And it, it could be just someone catching her attention. It could be all the camera flashes. Uh, Jerry seems so much more composed. I mean, he's deliberately composed himself to go out and do this speech. And Kate has had to sort of stand there symbolically, but clearly cannot do any talking. But when he says mummy, when he says mummy, that's like, a, it's like a, so traumatic for her that she looks away, out of the situation, away or out. Like, Jerry is not a source of comfort to her here, is he? And like, is it shame? Is it shame that's radiating through there? Um, certainly when he, he states, you know, her, role in the family it's more than she can bear to maintain her position in this conversation not you know in this statement let her come home to her mummy daddy brother and sister so it's it's 
It's not awful, but it's this moment where he breaks contact with his wife, elbows are out the way, says the word regret by mistake. For me, they're the standout moments of that. And we were told that these people might not be able to process their emotions yet. If it's this fresh, I don't know exactly how fresh, whether it's day one or day two. This, this weren't one of the first days that it happened, though. It's like, I think day three, by day three, they were doing, had the, you know, it was very quick that the media people from England went and got involved and the fighting fund was set up and all this. So it is part of the smokescreen idea as well, isn't it? That they would ask anyone and everyone from all over the world to call in, uh, make sure you look innocent when you do it. Um, but and despair that we are feeling. She actually reached for him, didn't she? That's why he put his arm around her. As the parents of our beautiful daughter, Madeline, we request that anyone... And when he said regret, regret, request, he's had to pull away. We may have any... And step, like, literally away from her. It makes me wonder as well, like I said, about who is complicit and to blame etc and who is ascribed the blame in this relationship because if Madeline has died in that apartment certainly Kate appears here to be far more distressed and um, I would say the word would be uh, traumatised than Jerry uh, Jerry being a surgeon maybe he's able to deal with these emotions better but uh, he actually steps away from her here like, and it makes me feel like she's been the one um you know, hands on with the issue and he's had to sort of do the clean up job and that's where we've got to today. Um, when he says daddy, her lips contract, was he a daddy? The information related to Madeline's... Um, also, we know that she mentioned earlier about her, um, her being an only child herself. So maybe she's got, you know, thoughts about her own daddy there. Disappearance, no matter how trivial, contact the Portuguese police and help us get her back safely. She's doing some breathing there when they're talking about the police, like deep breaths when they talk about the police. Please. I mean, I agree she might have been on medication and I, I just think, uh, what I'm looking for here is like the guy said, you're not able to process your, your feelings because it's so raw. And I'm seeing one person, Kate, who is clearly struggling and another person, Jerry, who's reading this fucking leaflet with like a emotionless newsreader type you know, media presentation. Uh, so there's a there's a difference in them for sure. Please, if you have Madeline, let her come home to her mummy, daddy, brother, and yeah. When he when he says daddy, she's like pulling in. It's it's like she's almost like holding it all in, isn't it? It's like the dam might be about to burst. Sister, this. So it's it's very awkward. You know, one of those interviews. It's it's distressing as well because you you feel for these people. When it, when I first saw it, obviously we all thought, "Oh my god!" Like I hope they find her, but it is it is definitely of interest when it comes to the idea that initially you find it more difficult to process your emotions, and later on you create a colourful story. Whereas it seemed that Jerry there was able to create a little bit of a colourful story straight off. So again, I'm going to say that story, you know, um, he was talking about our beautiful daughter and the emotions that, you know, we're totally distracted. Like, it might be that that's the media people doing these media answers for them and creating this narrative and that sometimes the McCann's lean on the media answers. When are you going to talk about that? Looking back now, you think that could have been your one chance? To save her. Well, as, as soon as... Um... Snip's working in the medical profession there. Don't get me started on surgeons and personality disorders. I w w won't ask yet. I won't ask. Um... I discovered that Madeline had been taken. It just, it just hit me straight away what she'd said that morning. And I just thought, oh my God, someone tried the night before. Okay, in statement analysis... Before the statement analysis, I'll just give you the, the body language breakdown very easily and quickly. Look. <laughs> To save her. Raise of the eyebrows while she's looking away, probably at Jerry here, you know, confirming the story, but raising the eyebrows in surprise that she's about to tell the lie or the believe me expression. I can't see the rest of her body, but you know, the believe me expression as in believe me, governor, no, like this is this is the truth. As soon as um blinks to show the uh, cognitive stress 
I discover that Madeline had been taken. Trying to look at the person in the eye and then having to look away again and look up because she just like discovered that Madeline had been taken, the statement itself. She couldn't look the woman in the eye and say it. It just, it just hit me straight away. A shake of the head when she says it hit me straight away. She'd said that morning and I just saw. What she said that morning and there was the micro expression of the raise of the eyebrow. What she said this, that morning with closed eyes and a raise of the eyebrow. Cognitive stress, not wanting to be in the situation, the believe me, look, the, the look of surprise at telling the lie. You've, you've said this now on telly. And I just thought, oh my God, someone tried the night before. Someone tried the night before, impassionate, expressionless, right down the barrel of your eyes. Liars often think if they look you in the eyes, it, it's more believable. You have to look them in the eye and appear believable. Look at the stress and fear on her face as well, the dilation of the pupils. Someone took, someone tried the night before, a shake of the head, and then a very stunted, like I said with Jerry, like initially you're emotive in your body language, and then when it becomes uh, the moment, then they sort of get self-stunted. Me straight away what she'd said that morning, and I just thought, oh my God, someone tried the night before. But they have edited it, so I don't know any further than that. Like. That's a, a breakdown, it might not be right. It's just what I'm seeing there. Let's see what he says about the words. In statement analysis, we have a number of well, he's loud sensitivity again. indicators that are very closely associated with deception. Now he's quiet. In again. fact, in this sentence itself, there's enough to conclude deception. First of all, she is infusing emotion into reporting what just should have been said. Well, yeah, but you did say that time after you know people do start to put the emotion it's four years later and they've got a media team so yeah i'll i'll say agree with him but also there's reasons second of all she's going to a conclusion she didn't say as soon as i saw that madeline was missing she said had been taken she didn't know that what parents of missing children do is they report their child missing they don't know if someone took them they don't know what happened this was big in the report the police, Goncalo Amaral, the book they tried to ban, he was big on this. I'll have to put that into a playlist for you, won't I? Um, he was big on that. He kept saying in his book that uh, they don't start with an assumption of kidnapping, that 80% or more of crimes in this case are done by people who are either the parents or known to the parents. Uh, most of the time they start with people close to home and that whilst the media at the time was hyped with full of pedos it was not the case that the world was absolutely rife with pedos and that uh, it seemed strange that on day one Kate and Jerry had this story this is the way it's going to go and that the, even though the police didn't want to follow it that way you know they wanted to be um, a bit more broad with their investigation. Uh, it got pushed that way in the media. So yeah, totally agree on that. Totally agree. It was wrong to initially. Like, if you, I, I also would think if your child was not there when you went to the hotel room, your first thought would you might worry and fear that something had happened to your child. But I guess your first thought, more likely than not, would be that uh, they'd wandered off or they'd gone somewhere that they weren't supposed to. And um, do you know what I mean? I, I just think you maybe you might be more inclined to go to the reception desk, the uh, check the pool maybe, you're worried they've gone in the pool and you know drowned in the pool, oh, for God forbid. But like to initially say, right, that's it, she's not there, she's been kidnapped. Boom. Like, it's a bit of a jump, it is a bit of a jump and a strange push of a narrative. Or if the child ran away, by jumping to the conclusion, she wants to make sure that you know there's a kidnapping. She has a need to persuade the audience there was a kidnapping. The need to persuade itself underlies the weakness. Then the inclusion of the emotions at the perfect point of the statement tells us it's artificially placed there, narrative building. So this is good. I think his, his uh, opinion is good, yeah, and I agree, narrative building. What I worry about is that we're four years later and like three million pounds into the campaign. So you've met the Pope and all that. Is what we're, what we're gonna say from his testimony here is that if there was a narrative built, therefore they are complicit in the crime, yeah? But uh, it could be that they're not complicit in the crime. Someone did kidnap her and that 
that narrative is making them fucking loads of money. So now they're on telly being interviewed. And the purpose of the interview ostensibly is to find Madeline. But the truth of the matter is the purpose of the interview is to get everyone paid and we've got a book out and, uh, you know, these other reasons. So to make the story as emotive and interesting as possible and to sell the book and, and all that, you know, it could be that the, the, the kind of guilt he's implying from these words might just be that they're media managed. So it's hard to, to decide whether that means that they did the crime, but it certainly is indicative of... Uh, deception when it comes to telling the truth in an interview. Then we have the infusion of deity. This is often found statistically in deceptive people. They're looking for a greater witness than their own words. Oh, this is massive in the McCann's case. Kate is like heavy on the God Squad as soon as like they both go to this Anglican church and they're involved with the church. But like after Madeline's death, Kate's got the Bible with her at all times. Like it's on the nightstand. It's got the you know she's. She's got the angels watching over the pictures of Madeline. Like, there's a, a heavy religious context with them, yeah. When they, I even, asked... they even visit the church in Prior de Luz. They get given the keys to the church, which some might say is the place that they hid Madeline's body for a while because, you know, cadaver dogs are not going to find the centre bodies in a crypt, are they? Because, like, everywhere is the centre bodies. So um, maybe that. Someone, why should I believe you? Because I told the truth. Because I'm telling you the truth. The... The weight of testimony is because it's true, which says basically, if you don't believe me, you're an idiot, get a new job. You shouldn't even be investigating because I told the truth. There's, the, the burden is on you because I'm free because I told the truth. No matter how much you dig, you'll never find contrary because it's truth. The entire weight of the argument is based upon truth. If someone says, I didn't steal the money, why should I believe you? Because I'm telling the truth. 99.9% .9 north, they're telling the truth. Yeah, and what we're describing here is this other thing that liars do, which is to try and give more detail because uh, there's, I think there's two reasons. We were talking about it with Steve the other day, uh, is that giving more detail because they expect to be questioned. So if you filled in all the detail in advance, then when it comes to the questioning, no, I said that, I pointed that out, I gave that detail. Uh, whereas people that are telling the truth don't feel the requirement to sort of defend themselves in that way. So as he said, they're very straightforward about it. Like, did you do this? No, I fucking didn't. And what? Uh, but people who lie feel the need to fill all the rest of the space and time with all these bits of detail and information. That's how powerful it is. They're basing their denial upon truth Often, if you want to spot a liar and you're in a one-to-one -one conversation with them, a tip, I mean, it's hard. I'm not suggesting that you can, but um, a good tip is that uh, you don't aren't like they say something and you don't question it. And often people are, oh right, well yeah, but you said this, and yeah, but what about that? And like, no, just be quiet and let them keep talking. And their anxiety and guilt will lead them into spilling more spurious information, and eventually they'll catch themselves out. When someone has a need to bring in a divine witness to what they're saying, and, and, and here in this case of doing that, she's making the assertion that Madeline had been taken, which is already conclusion. Sorry, he's speaking down into the microphone again, and it's peaking. Then calling on a divine witness by the inclusion of the word God. We could indicate here deception by itself and be confident that she's not telling the truth either. All right. Um... Oh, excuse me, another point with this, because there's actually a lot more here right. in this small answer. The word just, um, in statement analysis, we look at dependent words. Dependent words are those that don't work without another thought. So if I said, uh, this is my only child, instead of saying this is my child, this is my only child, what are you thinking of? The word only means you're thinking of something else. Did you lose a child? It's like when I was saying earlier that she said, I was an only child. Uh, she was describing her own position as a child, but she was also thinking of something else, wasn't she? She was thinking of uh, her relationship with her parents, maybe, or whatever. So he's saying this implication of these small words um, belies deeper thoughts. Well, did you try to have a child, couldn't have another one? You know, what happened there? Something happened. Um, in her case, the word just, it just hit me, and the word just hit me is the timing of the emotion. Okay, the emotion doesn't belong here, but it's part of her storytelling. And I just thought, 
my God, someone tried the night before. The word just there means she's comparing this thought with something else. Deceptive people do it all the time. They're comparing the thought that they're floating for the audience with the truth, what really happened. It's a small point, but when enough small points come together, it's a large point. Or as Asmongold would say, there's a point, there's another point, and two points make a line. Um, so I'm going to go on his expert like test. I don't know for a fact. I just want to review that again. I tried the night before. The word just there means she's comparing this thought with something else. I means she's comparing this thought with something else. I thought someone tried the night before. I just thought, so, oh, okay, okay. So he's saying that I just thought, so if I thought two different things, if I thought this and maybe that and the other, I could tell you that I thought two different things, this and that and the other. But if I only thought one thing, I'd just tell you I thought one thing. I thought this. But if I thought this, that and the other and didn't want you to know about that and the other, I'd say I just thought this. I didn't think that and the other, just this. Because I'm in my mind, in my subconscious, I'm separating the one idea from the other ideas and hiding the others. So just this, like uh, if you were stealing from the canteen <laughs> and you got two bags of crisps in your pockets and you don't want them to see that and you've got just, just the drink, it's just the drink, thanks. You put that on the counter and you pay for it. You know, you might just only have a drink and you might say, no, it's just the drink, thanks. Or you might say, Thanks, and just put the drink down. You're not qualifying the drink as being part of a wider collection. I just thought, if, if it's your only thought, I thought. If it's am amongst a collection of thoughts that you are selecting from, and you don't want me to hear the other thoughts, I just thought. So I understand that now. Deceptive people do it all the time. They're comparing the thought that they're floating for the audience with the truth. What really happened? And he's suggesting that she's not, I mean, I don't know, she could be selecting from other ideas and then deciding to tell the truth. But he's saying that people that tell the truth don't need to go through that selection process. So they wouldn't consider all these different lies and then tell the truth, they'd just tell the truth. So this is, I mean, it's quite a deep web, isn't it? It's quite a, a, a layered thing. But one small word in an interview four years later after they've become millionaires and met the Pope, uh, one small word, repeated in that way I think he's making a really good point I think it speaks to how someone's mind works and I think it speaks language is literally a representation of our thoughts isn't it and sometimes our thoughts come through before we think them even I, I'm doing it now I'm talking to you and just it's, it's happening you know I'm not having a good thinky think before every word so like, I better be right on my feet like my emotions my intent all that I better connect up because if not, the things that are coming out of my mouth are going to reveal it sometimes where there's a disconnection. Because it's quite hard to do a load of talking like I'm doing now or like anyone in, 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 in an interview does and to be hiding things and thinking other things and just not telling you this. Like there's like, that's a whole computation going on there and it's not easy. So I totally understand what you're saying and why these embedded confessions, the statement analysis is important. This is a statement analysis from four years later there is another hour of it, which we're going to get into in the next episode. Uh, we'll finish this original, um, where did I put it? Original news story and report and have a little look at one more and then we'll adjourn for the day uh, and we'll pick it back up. Uh, I don't even know what the fucking day is. So it's Thursday. We should pick it back up tomorrow in the daytime. Uh, I used to say 2 p.m. GMT, but We'll say like eat tea time, GMT, <laughs> somewhere. The house is a lot more up in the air at the moment, what's going on around my life. So sometime in the afternoon, GMT. <laughs> Let's finish off. This is home video of Maddie, a girl who next week celebrates her fourth birthday. The Portuguese police have been searching throughout the day, perplexed and baffled like so many here. This is an adjacent apartment to where the McCanns were staying and this room identical in layout to where Madeline was taken from. And the question now preoccupying police is, did somebody break in? And if so, how did they get through this type of shutter? And that's not the question preoccupying police. Preoccupying police. Uh, we read the police reports in our previous videos from the 
bloke who ran the investigation, the question preoccupying him was, like, what happened? Not, how did someone take her? What happened? Locals and holidaymakers alike joined the hunt. But 24 hours on, despite forensic efforts... And later on it was suggested they missed some places, like didn't check the bins, but they, in the book it said that they checked pretty much everywhere. Like, had a real good look with the dogs and everything. And a careful look for fingerprints that might point to a suspect. There appear to be no clues and no obvious leads. And in the videos that we made, there were were some clues and some obvious leads a bit later when the cadaver dogs got involved and the blood sniffer dogs got involved so um, we found out a bit more a bit later didn't we and the sense of shock is immense that's literally the street isn't it that's actually the street that we're talking about i can't quite i think this must be the front of the hotel and that must have been their apartment there and so the idea is that somebody walking down this street with this wall has just hopped it over there or these windows are here and they've grabbed her out of this window and they've trolleyed off with her. That's what the McCanns say. And the idea is that they're coming up this way to go and check on them sometimes and listen at these windows. So that's literally the street there, I think, isn't it? It's the thing you don't want to think about, though, because, I mean... These are just people who have nothing to do with it, so I don't know why we're listening to them. This, this is a case of an abduction. I don't think we can make any assumptions at this stage. That was the ambassador, and on day one, you know, two, no assumptions. But that got put in the, the bin, didn't it? Just like Madeline. Anyway, look. Mark Warner is a holiday brand trusted by many British families. And this video footage filmed here last week shows the care that staff take to keep track of their youngest customers. Sorry, really, I should do that with the, the buttons, shouldn't I? I should do that properly with the buttons. Uh, that theory got put in the bin. Just like Madeline. No, he didn't. Yeah, I did, yeah. Shouldn't make jokes about that. It's not funny. She's dead. It's sad. All right. I'm sorry. It wasn't me. It was bad me. This has become an agonizing way for a close It was, this, it was, it was bad me. That wanted simply to enjoy the sunshine of the Algarve, a family that now faces terrifying uncertainty over the fate of Madeline. So that was the initial news report, and then their first interview is like a 10-minute piece. Power to get your daughter. So we're going to do this. You know, we're going to watch all the embedded confession video. We're going to reflect on it like we've been doing today that'll probably be another episode entire entire episode oh no i didn't i did and i also agree that it's sad that she died and we shouldn't make jokes but also i can't help but be me and it's like years and years later and things pop in my head and i just do the fucking jokes so at least we've got bad me bad me at least we've got that bad bad me that i couldn't say it was him um and I apologise. Anyway, look, we're going to also look at the, you know, the first interviews they gave. We've got stuff that we're going to be analysing ourselves because there's no textual analysis of it. So that's what's coming up in the, the following episodes. Sorry if they're inconsistent, but at least they're inconsistently consistent. You know that on Ganji Kid, you're going to get some Genshin Impact uploads from Twitch. You're going to get some words on stream. You're going to get some what we're doing now. Uh, all sorts of stuff. Even we might start filtering in some other games because on the request, someone's requested, haven't they? Someone's requested that we do a bit of Rome War, Rome War, Rome. I thought of, I thought of it, and it all came together. You know that re that request for the ro you need a side eye emoji. I don't even know what it means. Side eye is that like shifty? Um, Someone requested, and I realised, I don't know if this is going to tickle your fancy, but I've already played it once, but in Fallout Ve New Vegas, right, in Fallout New Vegas, this might not, this might not count, but I think it counts. I think it counts. In Fallout New Vegas, one of the factions is the Legion, and Caesar is their leader, right? And they're the baddies. They're the fucking baddies, I'm telling you. Like, I know they're the baddies. You know they're the baddies. We all know they're the baddies in Fallout New Vegas. So when I played it, they're the baddies and I killed them all and I hated them. But why don't I, I, uh, I might, well, why not? Why don't we play Fallout New Vegas again? And I'll be a Roman Legion man and I'll kill everyone else instead. So I can be, we can do that. It, it's, it's somewhere in the middle. It's somewhere in the middle of like actually a Rome game with war and all that and a fun game with all sorts of weird shit going on. And I don't know, Fallout New Vegas. So I've got it. I bought it on Steam. Um, uh, judging you with the side, I look bad, man. You want me to do it? I'm not planning on doing emojis for like negative things like that.
<laughs> I want people to share my emojis with joy and, and love. Not like, it's Ganges emojis. They're like, all the bad things. A chuffer. Do an emoji for being a big chuffer. So I thought we might we might play this. It might not tick all the boxes, but it will have Rome as an influence and a, there will be war involved because look at that big weapon. There'll be some chopping. I might make a melee build. You know, do some chopping. And these chuffers are bad chuffers as well. They're, they're like cannibals and bad chuffers. So we might have a look at New Vegas. I never did any of the DLC when I was a kid as well. Like when I was a kid, when I was younger. Um, but Caesar's Legion... They're part of it, and I never followed the storyline before, so that excites me. And it's only three ninety nine on Steam at the moment, which is a good deal. Um, that face I just made. Well, I don't want to do that face I just made as an emoji. That would be an awful emoji. I will do it. I'm going to find an artist, contact them, get them to make the emojis, and they're all going to be fucking lovely things like giving out flowers. There's not going to be any stink eyes. I don't want any stink eyes. You'll have to type it into chat, slash stink eye. And, oh. and then what happens if that takes off and like it becomes a popular emoji on Twitch and people are all using the stink eye. Oh, where did you get that stink eye emoji? Oh, I like that one. And people get used to me as being the fucking streamer with the stink eye. Oh, it's that streamer with that emoji. Oh, the stink eye. That's their feelings they get when they think about me. I don't want that. <laughs> they can fuck off. Shouldn't be covering this Jerry McCann chuffer for that exact reason. Don't want to be connected to him. I'm against him. If anything, I'm against him. Shouldn't say that on the internet. He's got loads of money. Perhaps I'll get murdered. Um, right. It's not about me. Half-Life. Yeah, they've done a VR version, um, which I'm interested in playing. It's hard to do VR on stream because you can't interact as easy. Interactive, isn't it? I'm talking to you right now. Interactive. But it's harder to do that uh, when I've got a headset on. But they've, I want to play the, um, the VR version. Uh, yeah, there's loads of games. There's loads. It was just requested of me because I upload Genshin Impact. I play Genshin Impact on Twitch every day. And I upload the uh, uploads here, like, bit by bit over time. We're a little bit behind. We're about 11 episodes behind real-life Genshin Impact. So later on on Twitch, I'm going to play some Genshin Impact. About 11 episodes into the future of that one. But this channel is my stream channel. So everything we do on stream goes here, including Genshin Impact. And it was said, it was requested that I stop playing that fucking cartoon game with the girls running around. Which is a kung fu anime game. But I stopped playing that and instead played like Rome War. So I think I will filter in more varied gameplay to these uploads and, and live streams. So yes, accepted, noted, agreed. Um... And I couldn't think of anything more wonderful, Warrior of Rome-esque <laughs> than chopping people's heads off in a nuclear irradiated Mojave wasteland. So uh, are we going to do John Bennett Ramsey? Um, it was suggested in chat. It was. I've not, I'm not American, believe it or not. <laughs> but uh, I don't know a lot about it. But uh, Madly I'm McCann is definitely my wheelhouse. Uh because I murder kids. Wait, wait. Madly I'm a is definitely my wheelhouse. Because I murder kids. No, no, no. Don't, uh, not because he murders kids, but Madly I'm a was on the news. I was in the country. I saw it happen. Don't know anything about John Bennett Ramsey, but can look on the internet and find out and do a bit, yeah. I can react to a video about it, certainly, but I can't put in so much of my... Um, I can analyse an interview, but I, other than that, I haven't got, like, years and years of constant media influx to... Like, you know, Madly Army County is, like, part of the tapestry of British life. Uh, her story has not been let go. And she will keep being dredged up. It's raining again. Dredged I up. Be happier. Swish, Thanks I for the tippies. Swish. Thanks for the tippies. Dredged up. She keeps getting dredged up at times of political turmoil when they want something to put on the news. So, um, yeah. I'll just say yes to everything. And then if I do a John Bennett Ramsey one, it'll be in like 10 years time. And I'll be like, I said I was going to do it. I've eventually done it. Like I do with most things. Like it took us a year to make a podcast. Um, any loot gift requests from TwitchCon? You're going to TwitchCon? I should send you this in the post. I should send you this in the post. <laughs> Um, I don't have any requests. Thank you for the tippies. They're massive. Thanks. It's huge. Uh, my request is just that you have a great time and don't worry about, like, you know, don't worry about me <laughs> while you're out there having a good time. Go and have the good time. Um, uh, yeah, that's my only request. Of course, 
anything Genshin Impact related, like I would cream myself over. But like, no, I, I honestly, I don't need. I haven't got you know. I haven't got one of those shelves behind me with all the items on. Um, like, I don't need any toys or presents. You tippy me. That's wonderful. Thank you. So uh, and yeah, the main request is that you just have a good time and enjoy it and uh, take it all in. And at some point, maybe if you're fed up and a bit bored towards the end, just think to yourself, hang on. We're a bit lucky here, aren't we, in this uh, capitalist Western wonderland? Like, we are, aren't we? You are, like, we are. Um, this is something that I'll just finish on before I finish, which is, you know, it's sad what happened to Madeline. It is sad what happened to Madeline. In the main, right, most of the kids in Western wonderland don't have that tragic thing happen to them. Most of us, if you're watching this on the internet today, most of you will be in a situation where you've got heating that you're struggling to afford to pay for, but heating, uh, electric lighting, you've got a toilet that flushes, and even if you're really struggling for food, there might be a food bank even down the road, but most shops are stocked with foods of reasonable prices, hopefully. They're going up, but do you know what I mean? Like, there are opportunities in your life. Like, all of those things are massive. They're massive. Because uh, we might not be able to help Madeline, but on this stream, regularly, we donate to this charity, UNICEF. And with the reason we do that is because it's the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund. So when there are children going through emergencies, like this Ukraine thing, for example, uh, but lots of other things look, lots of other things, cholera threat. Um, like children shouldn't, in my opinion, have to suffer as a, a matter of course because of where they're born. So like, we're really lucky. Like we in our in our lives are really lucky. So like enjoy yourself. I'm not saying like feel bad for other kids when you're there, but take it in and enjoy it and like have that enjoyment because we're lucky. Like uh, it's not that we should feel bad for being lucky. We do our bit to help people, and you do a lot to help people yourself. So uh, when you're there enjoying the um, the benefit, the TwitchCon is it TwitchCon you said? You know, you know in America you pledge allegiance to the flag. You know, you pledge, you you know, praise the legends of the flag and all that. This is what it's, this is what it provides, isn't it? The freedom to go and enjoy yourself. So you shouldn't feel any negative feelings about that. And like, like I was saying at the end, when you're feeling a bit tired and it's time to go home, just reflect on how wonderful it is to be able to do these things. Uh, sorry, cookie policy. I don't know why I've got a cookie policy on that. Got a loudness, loudness policy. There's some people. She's got horns. They're dressed. He's got a shield. That's the pogger's face. They had to change the pogger's face, though, didn't they? They're... That, is that a Pokemon? That's Father Christmas. Pretty sure about that. She's got pizza. It's all going fast, very quick. I can't... It's very bright, isn't it? It's very brightly coloured. The children these days have problems with their retinas. Is it need to be that bright? Is that's why they're all wearing sunglasses indoors. TwitchCon. I don't really understand what's happening. So it might be me, but I don't really understand what's happening. It looks like a lot of fun. Um, it's in your city, so yeah, absolutely. Just like When the shit like that goes on, go down, take it in, enjoy it. You know, be part of it and... Uh, enjoy our lives because that's what it's about isn't it yeah fight for your right to party exactly and with that said uh ha having streamed on youtube i'm going to finish on the twitch logo i was going to finish on unicef instead i'm going to finish on the twitch logo <laughs> um and like we'll do more about madly i mccann because children's lives are important that's you know the main reason i'm doing this it's also i feel that it's important i've always wanted to say my piece on it because everyone's got an opinion. Opinions are like arseholes. Everyone is one. But uh, now I've got a little bit of a chance to. thought it might make a few episodes. So as long as you're happy, I'm happy. Um, you're big on... In Canada, Canada sounds nice. It does sound nice to me. You've got, you know, the benefit of lots of... Um, lots of things America has, but without some of the horrible things like everyone getting shot all the time. <laughs> I'm not going to do politics now. I'm not going to do politics now, but it does sound nice to be Canada. You know, uh, it does. Um, yeah, so everyone be good. 
and uh, we'll adjourn now and you want to promote my channel I don't, you, you can do what you like I don't think people at listen people that have gone to TwitchCon they've already got their ideas about who their favourite people are to the point where they've turned up at fucking TwitchCon right and uh, if you are a streamer like you can count yourself what I'll give you the duty of or the um well, I'll, let, well I'll, I'll give you the title. You're officially a producer. You can call yourself that and say that by being like top dono on this stream, uh, I your chosen stream accounts you as producer and your ideas are heard and warranted uh, as input. Like we discuss what's going on on the stream together, don't we? So um, you can have that, that role if you want and network to your heart's content. But I think people there are just there to have fun. I, I don't know if promotionally telling people at TwitchCon to, to watch this, they're going like, to be out busy talking to people. They'd have to get home after, go tired, sleepies, wake up later, and then think, oh, I might watch some Twitch today. Oh, I might watch that stream. That. By then, it's quite a late since... Like, you'd have to like fucking tattoo it on their hand or something to make them remember. Like Best thing, just network and enjoy yourself. And if you meet people and they just say, what's your role? Are you a streamer? You can say, no, I'm a producer. I don't, I don't have to... I'm more in the, more in the field of production. If you fancy it, you know, do whatever you like. Like you're, you're quite an important part of this stream. So um, if they're always looking for new stuff, then recommend it by all means. But uh, I feel in those sort of situations, it's better just to be present and make friends. And like, you know, self-promotion is second place to um, real human interaction and authentic, you know, friend making. So if later on you've made some friends and they trust your recommendations, then recommend me, please. Thank you. But like, you know, going to TwitchCon, and I used to do flyers. I used to do promotion of businesses with flyers, like whether it was my own drum and bass nights or the hairdressing. And like, you know, one in 10 people are, are only interested enough to take the flyer because they want some roach card. The rest of them throw it on the floor. I don't know. Like, don't badger them. Just enjoy yourself. Just enjoy yourself. Free tattoos, yeah. Free Ganji Kid tattoos for anyone that's stupid enough to get one. I'll cover the cost. I will. You can cover it. You just pay for it. <laughs> you tell them at the thing, I will pay for you to get a tattoo as long as it's this. And then video it on your phone. You'll actually get a million views out of that. And we'll all be, no, because YouTube won't allow it because it's, uh, it's it's damaging, harmful acts. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly had a good idea then. All right, you be good. <laughs> you got an ASMR road trip tattoo? That's hectic. I've got tattoos. I haven't got any ASMR ones though. I should do an ASMR tattooing session. Anyway, look, we're going way off track and I've come to the end of the episode and I'm still talking. So uh, I'm going to say you be good and I'm going to press stop streaming and we'll officially do the end now. Um, yeah, don't get, don't, yeah, don't get anything with my tattoo because I will change the name and the logo. Yes, absolutely. No, nothing is permanent. <laughs> you be good, my little Pukos. You be good. If you can't be good, uh, get yourself down to TwitchCon because I hear they're all naughty.